And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce the CEO and executive editor of Africa.com, Teresa Clark, who leads our work in women leading corporate Africa. This is a topic she knows quite well. Teresa has lived or, work in, or worked in Africa for over 25 years. She was the first black woman to be named managing director in the investment banking division of Goldman Sachs. She has served as an independent board director on public companies listed in three continents, which is Africa, Australia, and the US. Today, she serves on the board of Arthur J. Gallagher, a Fortune 500 company listed on the New York Stock Exchange. And now I turn over to Teresa. Thank you. Thank you, Soku. And thank you to everyone for joining us today for Women Leading Corporate Africa. I can't tell you how excited we are about this work. Uh, let me start by thanking the generosity of British Petroleum and Old Mutual, without whom this work would not be possible. But let me also thank our thought leadership partner, Standard Bank, with whom we're developing this work. Standard Bank is a true content collaborator from concept creation to execution, not just a financial sponsor, but a partner in every sense of the word. I want to thank you to Sil, Gabuza, and Katleho Maleka and their teams. And as Standard Bank said to us, this isn't just a list. This is the start of a movement. And let me tell you how we got started with this work. In early 2021, the Africa.com team was thinking about women in the corporate sector in Africa. The leading woman in corporate Africa had just retired. And we said to ourselves, who's next on the list? We looked online and we couldn't find a good list to tell us who were the women leading big business in Africa. Lists of women in business in Africa have a tendency to focus on entrepreneurs and small and medium-sized businesses. Now, SMEs are critical to Africa's growth. We know that they are the engine for job creation and we ourselves are a small African business and we know how many African jobs we create at Africa.com. And so we have every bit of respect for SMEs and entrepreneurs. But not every African woman is going to be an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurship is not for every man or every woman. And some women should be aspiring to roles in the corporate Africa. Why aren't African women being encouraged to take the top spot at the largest, most complex organizations on the continent? Once we started with that, we just found a, a passion, a fire in our belly to understand this topic and understand who's there and to do as much as we can to encourage women in Africa to go after that top rung. That's what brings us here today. We started by asking our friends at Bloomberg, Irena Stennett in particular, to work with us to provide data on the over 1,400 companies that are listed on the 24 stock exchanges in Africa. From there, we screened those companies for size and we picked out those that had a market capitalization over 150 million US dollars. That's how we defined big. That left us with about 355 companies. And we decided to put a really hot shot research team led by Milka Terrablanche and myself and Laura Joseph and Deborah Winter at Africa.com all played a role in that research team. And we decided to look at who are the women running those companies, large, complex, publicly listed companies in Africa. Well, that brought us to just a little over 20 women. And so we thought, hmm, we, have we been completely fair about this? And we realized that some of the companies on our list are huge and have divisions which would stand to qualify on our list if those divisions were spun out on their own. So we went back and did the deep financial analysis to look within those large corporates in Africa to find divisions where they were, that were headed by women. And we found another good number of women who are running divisions that are valued at 150 million. Lastly, we thought about global corporations that are listed on stock exchanges throughout the world. And we thought if those companies have women running the Africa region or a country within Africa, well, they should be qualified to be on our list as well. So those are the three different groups. This work has now evolved into much more than a list. As we went about doing this work, we continued to be challenged by those who we spoke with who said, what, don't just do a list. What does a list really accomplish? You need to don't, we need to not just write about it, we need to do something about it. So we now have four initiatives under this Women Leading Corporate Africa umbrella. 
We start with the list, which we are going to reveal to you today. Today, you will find out for the first time who the 50 women leading corporate Africa are. From there, we've decided to have a second event, not just revealing the list, but having some good conversations with the women on the list and talking about topics that are of importance to developing that pipeline of women to lead corporate Africa. And thus we bring to you today's summit. We will start with Tony Mayo, professor from Harvard Business School, who's done research on black women in the corporate world. And we're really happy that he's going to be able to share that information with us today. It has a little bit of a U.S. side to it, but it's the most in-depth work that has been done that we've found academically, globally on this topic. So he's definitely the leader in researching this area. Um, but we wanted to bring it back to Africa. So we asked four of the women from our list to respond to his remarks. So we're going to have a fantastic panel of women CEOs then responding to this research. We've decided to do a listening tour. As we talk to the women on the list, we realized that they had so much to say. So we've formally captured all of these conversations in in-depth interviews, which we're calling a listening tour of women leading corporate Africa. All of these videos will be available for free for anyone who wants inspiration or knowledge about this space. And they will be available on Africa.com, but we are going further than that. We are going to have all of these transcribed and donated to the leading business schools on the continent because they will serve as important archival historical materials for decades and hundreds of years to come about the women who were pioneers in this space at this moment in time. Lastly, we are doing something to change that pipeline and to increase it. We're looking to do training, training that will help women climb the corporate ladder in Africa. And the very first event will be one week from today. One week from today, we are having a large virtual session structured like this one for free online um, that is aimed and targeted at women who have less than five years experience in the corporate sector in Africa. It's gonna be a fantastic session led by another woman on our, um, on our list, um, and Ida Diaria, who heads Visa for All of Africa, who will tell her inspiring story. And we will have a fantastic speaker from Harvard Business School who's written a book about the secrets of getting into the private sector and starting your career there. So that's what we have lined up. And this is just the start. There's a lot more work behind the scenes that we can't um, announce yet, but we are very committed to this topic. So from there, I will say just a word or two about who's in the room today. Uh, the one thing about virtual events is that you don't know who you're virtually sitting next to. And today I want to let you know that we have over 1500 registrants who um, look to join us today. Um, of those 1,500 registrants, the majority come from the African continent. We have people registered from over 30 countries on the continent and over 20 countries around the world. Most of the people who are joining us today are C-suite executives themselves. We have the 50 women who are on our list. They all have comms departments in their large corporates. And so we welcome all of you from the list as part of our audience today. We've also partnered with Women Corporate Directors who has invited all of their membership globally. These are women who are on the boards of these very companies. And so we have a large constituency of women in about 12 countries around the world who are members of Women Corporate Directors sitting on boards of companies that have a market value of over 200 million. We have a fair number of academics. We have Professor Tony Mayo from Harvard Business School. So as you might imagine, a number of his colleagues and students from Harvard Business School are on this call, but we also have people from the major business schools across the continent, Gibbs Business School, Lagos Business School, Strathmore Business School. We also have people from the African Leadership Academy. Thank you all for being a part of this. So with no further ado, let me turn this over to Tony Mayo. As I introduce Tony, you can see what his title is. Um, I won't belabor the point that he is a senior lecturer at Harvard Business School, part of a team, I should say, who did this work um, called Beating the Odds, looking at African American, or I guess I should say black alumni is the right way to say it, Tony, black alumni from Harvard Business School. He'll show you what geographies were represented. It wasn't just American. Um, he is the C. Roland Christensen Distinguished Management Educator in the Organizational Behavior Unit of Harvard Business School. He is a professor of leadership and organizational behavior and authentic leader development in the MBA program. 
But more than all that, I've known Tony since I was 26 years old, because Tony and I were classmates at Harvard Business School long before he had that distinguished gray hair. Um, we sat in the, in the same row as we got our MBAs um, at Harvard back in the 1980s. And I must tell you that when I heard Tony do this presentation a couple of years ago, I walked up to him afterwards and I said, Tony, if you told me then that you would be an expert on Black women, I just would have rolled over. And I'm just so amazed that at the level of commitment and interest and expertise he has developed in the space that relates to me personally. So this means an awful lot to me, not just for this webinar, but to me personally, to hear Tony share the knowledge that he's developed on Black women in the corporate world. So thank you so much, Tony, for the work that you do and continue to do to advance Black women in the corporate sector. And thank you for coming today to share that knowledge with us and our audience here at Africa.com. Great. Uh, thank you, Teresa. Thank you for those kind words. It's great to see you. Uh, we actually sat uh, pretty close to each other when we were students as well. Um, so it, it's terrific uh, to be collaborating um, with Teresa and with all of you today. So what I thought I would do is just share with you some of the research uh, that I've been doing um, over the last several years, looking at the enablers and obstacles to success for underrepresented individuals and organizations with a particular focus on the black experience. And so as I go through this, uh, let me just tell you um, a bit about the inspiration for this work. So this uh, work that I'm gonna present to you uh, today is really uh, focused on the 50th anniversary celebration of the African-American Student Union. That was our inspiration. So in 2018, that marked the 50th anniversary of the formation of AESU. And these five individuals, this was their class picture in 1968, these five individuals formed that African-American Student Union, including Lillian Lincoln Lambert, who was the first black woman to graduate <clears throat> from Harvard Business School in 1969. And so their efforts really focused on increasing the number of people of color in the MBA program, particularly a number of blacks in the MBA program, increasing the case diversity in our programs and increasing the faculty and staff of color at Harvard Business School. And so their work and their legacy has carried on and we wanted to mark that 2018 celebration. But as part of that, I really wanted to do a deep dive into the experiences of our uh, black MBAs. And so that the motivating question I had was what can we learn about the career paths and perspectives of MBAs? And this came from earlier work that I had done with our former Dean, Nithin Noria on this book called Paths to Power. So we, we wrote this book on Paths to Power and this was really uh, an in-depth look at whether the United States is a land of opportunity this sort of rags to riches story that we like to tell, that anybody with pluck and drive and determination can succeed in the United States. Is that really a myth or is that uh, reality? And largely it's a myth. And because we celebrate these larger than life figures, in a way it seems that it's more possible than it actually is. And so we did a deep dive into uh, race, gender, social class, religion, ethnic ethnicity to really try to understand what was the path of insiders and what was the path of outsiders. And there was clearly two different paths. So if you were a woman, if you were a person of color, um, your path was an outside path. There were very few uh, opportunities for success in the 20th century in the traditional corporate establishment. And so what we ended up finding is that there were four paths to power for outsiders. One path, uh, path was place. Uh, and what we meant by place was that uh, many uh, individual outsiders on the list ended up creating for, uh, businesses for people like themselves. So women creating businesses for women, blacks creating businesses for blacks. Uh, you stayed in your community, you created an opportunity there and potentially it expanded out. And so place was one way that you could gain success as an outsider by serving a particular community. The second was personal network. So having these connections, having these mentors, having these sponsors, having these individuals who can support you along the way was critically important for outsiders, people who had their back. The third was professional credentials. So we saw on our list of great business leaders as we looked over a hundred year period in the 20th century was that the women, uh, the people of color were far more educated than their white counterparts, uh, than their white male counterparts. And partly that was because of this need to gain access and legitimacy uh, as an outsider, sometimes professional credentials gave you that added lift, that added legitimacy uh, that you needed. 
And the fourth was perseverance. So every Black woman on our list of great business leaders as we did this survey in Pass to Power was a founder. So there was no other traditional path to reach uh, the top uh, in the uh, 20th century. And so we wanted to really understand um, today, if our Black MBAs, are they more like outsiders or are they more like insiders? So if you think about coming to Harvard Business School, it's the insider's inside path, right? This is the ticket uh, that uh, you have to success. And a lot of times we talk about Harvard Business School as being a transformational experience. And I really wanted to understand, do our Black MBAs uh, have experiences that are similar to insiders, because this is the insider's inside path, or are they more similar to outsiders? And so that's what really was motivating the question, was trying to understand uh, what we can learn about our Black uh, MBAs. And so to be able to do that, I ended up having to build a database of Black MBAs. And you might think that that would be relatively easy, but when I went to our alumni relations office and said, hey, can you give me a list of all of our Black MBAs? Uh, they could not. Uh, we had, did not capture that information until 1996. And so prior to 1996, we didn't have any records of uh, any official records of our Black MBAs. And so through a painstaking process over about 12 to 18 months, we were able to pull together archival information and be able to, and we were able to build a data set of all of our, uh, or I, I won't say all because I'm sure we missed uh, some, but uh, with I think 95, 96% cer certainty, uh, a data set of our black MBAs uh, from the beginning of the school's establishment in 1908 to the present uh, day. And for the last 40 years of those graduates, we decided to append all of the job history that we could find, uh, where they went to school, uh, where they worked, how they advanced in their careers, all of those uh, different uh, demographic variables. We did a series of satisfaction surveys and uh, in-depth interviews and focus groups. And I'm gonna share with you some of the quotes and some of the thoughts of the individuals uh, that we interviewed as I go along with this presentation. And so all of this, uh, resulted in um, alumni about 2,300. We can say with relative certainty that there have been 2,300 alumni of Harvard Business School, Black alumni. And when I mean Black, I mean both African-American U.S. citizens and um, uh, Blacks from across uh, the world, Africa, South America, Caribbean, et cetera. Uh, and so about 2,300, and of that, those 2,300 alumni, which represents a little less than 4% of total alumni of Harvard Business School, uh, for the ones from 1977 to 2015, there were 1,821, and that is the group that I centered the research on, looking at the last 40 uh, years or so. And of that group, we were able to get full employment history on over 75%. Uh, so this is the one of the largest databases of Black professionals that has ever been built. Uh, we're looking at about uh, almost 1,400 uh, records uh, there. To give you a sense of some of the background information, the demographic data, this is a, the numbers of the uh, Black MBAs uh, in each class year from 1969. So that was uh, those five that formed the African American Student Union, the inspiration for this work. And you can see the efforts that they had. In the second next year of Harvard Business School, we had 27 Black graduates uh, in the MBA program. Prior to 1969, there were no more than uh, two Black uh, students in any HBS class. In 1969, there were five. That was the highest number up until that point in the previous uh, 60 or so years. And so you can see how the numbers have trended over time. There's been uh, some uh, peaks and some valleys uh, along the way. One of the things that we see in this data is that over the last 25 years, the number of Black students in the MBA program has stayed steady at 55. And that was actually a revelation for us because I think we hadn't really done a deep dive into our alumni by race uh, in any way. We sort of aggregated all minorities into one category. And this was a way for us to sort of say, okay, uh, we really haven't moved the needle in any way. This was a wake-up call for us. It was a wake-up call for the admissions office to say, hey, we need to do a better job. We've stayed st steady and flat at about 55 for the last 25 years. And um, the mix of that, tw uh, of that 55 has also changed. So this gives you a sense of over the last five decades where the Black uh, MBAs are coming from. And so in 70s, 80s, 
94% from the US and you see that number uh, going down to about 86% in the 2010s and, and in the decade that we're in now, it's probably closer to 84% uh, and a wider uh, group coming from Africa, uh, somewhat um, relatively flat from the Caribbean and, and South America. So you can see the distribution of the black alumni um, over time. And in terms of the gender composition, actually black women have outpaced women overall at HBS uh, since the early 2000s, right now representing about 43 to 44% of the black MBAs in the class, which is higher than the number of overall women in the class. This actually speaks to uh, the statistics and the data of uh, women in graduate programs in the United States uh, overall. And just a little bit of a background in terms of where they came from. We were interested in what was their path to HBS. And so you can see here uh, the percentage of uh, black graduates who came from an Ivy League institution, historically black college or university or a top 100 national university, as well as other uh, schools across the world. And you can see heavy concentration in elite institutions. So this gets to that earlier point on the path to power. How do you actually get access? How do you get opportunity? A lot of it is uh, uh, being able to uh, go to an Ivy League institution, being able to go to a top 100 institution. So if I were to tell you the, the top 10 institutions uh, that have brought MBAs, have brought alumni into the program, Harvard represents 11% of all black MBAs, and then Howard University in Washington, DC, Stanford, Yale, Penn, uh, down the line. Number 11 would be Spelman. It's a, a lot of times people ask me, who's where's Spelman on the list? Spelman, historically black college in Atlanta, uh, focused on women, that would be number 11. And so we were interested to see, okay, this looks at this 40 year history, and you can see that there's a high concentration of expectation that graduates are coming from particular types of schools. And so getting into Harvard is actually harder uh, as a person of color. And so you look at this and you say, okay, how has that changed over time? Uh, and what we can see is actually it's gotten much more concentrated over time uh, than less concentrated in terms of Ivy Leagues, historically black colleges and top 100 uh, liberal arts and national institutions. So you can see this very high concentration of elite experiences. And let me just share with you one uh, perspective from somebody we interviewed. You look around at the education of black folks versus white folks. You start to notice a pattern that all the black folks are superbly educated. The black folks went to Ivy League schools. The white folks went to possibly whatever schools they wanted to go in. So you start to see that black folks are screened much more. You have to have accomplished or gone to much better schools to get the same position as a person who's not black. So her perspectives represent a number of the women that we spoke to in terms of their expectation of what they needed to do to be able to get into HBS and beyond. What I wanna share with you is some of the research on the survey data that we've done. We've been doing a longitudinal survey of uh, MBAs from since 2015. We do it every other year. We've just uh, done the most recent survey and I'm gonna share with you some uh, data on enablers and obstacles to success. And this led to the work on paths to power and how uh, particular individuals uh, beat the odds in terms of their access to opportunity. So the first thing I'm going to share with you is satisfaction by race. So this looks at, and, and here I'm comparing uh, white uh, alumni and black alumni. And again, black represents not just U.S. black citizens, but um, uh, the global uh, alumni uh, base of black graduates. And so for women and men here, um, these are sort of work metrics in terms of satisfaction. How satisfied are you with being able to do meaningful work? your career growth and professional accomplishments. And as you can see from this particular graph, uh, men are far more satisfied than women on all of these dimensions. That's not a big surprise. We often uh, see that. Uh, white women are more satisfied than black women on all of these dimensions as well. And these are statistically significant uh, differences in terms of satisfaction. That being said, the satisfaction is relatively high. It's not, it's not super low, uh, but it does show you the differences in terms of uh, views of the workforce and the work metrics. And then if I look at this from a personal metrics perspective, so your ability to contribute to society, your ability to combine personal and professional life, 
and your life overall. Again, you see differences uh, between uh, men and women where uh, there is uh, some difference in terms of the satisfaction of men uh, on these versus women, particularly white men, more satisfied in all of them. But some of the, the, uh, the same patterns uh, appear here in terms of differential uh, satisfaction. And that plays a role in access to opportunity. Um, and part of the satisfaction is driven by some key enablers to success. And so what I wanna do is share with you a couple of different uh, factors of looking at success, job advancement factors, uh, support systems and work-life balance. And we looked at a number of different, we probably looked at 20, 25 different factors to try to understand what are the key drivers of success for underrepresented individuals and organization and particularly for black executives. And so I'm just gonna focus on the ones that were statistically significant, the ones that were most important. I'm not gonna share all of it. Um, but the three that were considered the most important in terms of job advancement and development were these three. So the opportunity to have developmental or visible job assignments, to have significant general or line management experience and to have a global assignment. So again, we looked at 15 variables uh, uh, and these three were the most important. Again, what you can see here, what we see on the left side uh, on the experienced is the percentage of alumni that experienced these aspects of, in their career, these different enablers in their career. And then on the right side under beneficial is the percentage of those who actually experienced it and thought it was beneficial. So not a big surprise that if you experience developmental assignments, if you experience general management experience, if you experience a global assignment, you thought it was beneficial. In fact, if you look at the, the, uh, the red lines on the right for black women, um, they found it most beneficial. They see the greatest value in all of these opportunities. One thing that is a little bit surprising when we look at this data, or maybe it's not totally surprising, is that um, Black women are much more likely to be given developmental or visible job assignments than they are to be given significant general or line management experience. So Sometimes what we see uh, in the United States is corporations get credit, if you will, for putting underrepresented individuals in visible assignments, but does that actually translate into line management, general management experience? It doesn't, it, it, according to this, uh, there's far less uh, uh, general management experience than there is visibility within the organization. Uh, that's the opposite for white men. So one of the interesting things uh, that I'm looking at in this particular data is to try to understand, do those developmental assignments actually turn into uh, something that is running a large division, that is taking on a stretch assignment, that's pushing uh, the individual forward? The second set of uh, enablers focuses on support systems. And so in here, we looked at four formally assigned mentors, mentors who are not formally assigned, so informal mentorship, seeing people like you in an organization and affirmative action uh, programs. These were all of the four that uh, had some sin significance in them. One of the things that you can see here is that uh, black men and black women alumni were much more likely to be uh, part of a formally assigned mentorship program. So we see a lot of organizations focusing on, okay, we're going to have for formal mentorship programs uh, within organizations. We're going to take people who are largely underrepresented in the organization and try to provide this support mechanism. Unfortunately, what you see on the right side is that many of the folks that are in those programs don't find it very beneficial. In fact, there's a wide gap between uh, uh, informal versus formal mentorship real mentorship comes, a real opportunity comes from these informal connections that people make, these informal opportunities to be able to leverage relationships uh, with people within the organization based on sources of power. So when I talk a lot about this work and I talk to my older white colleagues, they're like, what can I do? Well, you can be a mentor, you can be a supporter, you can sponsor somebody. You don't have to be formally assigned. You can take these opportunities uh, going forward. Um, the other thing that you can see from this particular uh, chart is that um, uh, black women um, tend to see uh, wide benefits of seeing people like them in the organization, even though they're the least likely to be able to see that. And one other sort of final aside on this particular uh, graph is that you can look at the numbers on affirmative action and you can see that black men and black women um, see opportunities associated, have experienced opportunities associated with affirmative action and see the benefits of those. 
Uh, the thing that I find surprising in this is that white women see uh, themselves not um, having experienced th these and not necessarily seeing the benefit of it. But we know from research that white women are the largest beneficiaries of any affirmative action programs uh, in place. And so it's interesting to see the disconnect there uh, that's going on in this particular data. We black women need to be doing more networking. We need to lift up our heads from all the work that we are focusing on. We tend not to network and that is hurting us. We're not spending time to build rapport with the people that are making the decisions about who gets the next job, who gets the big opportunity. They don't know us. They have not heard what we have accomplished. And so what she's speaking to is what we hear a lot in my research is that black executives in particular black women feel that they have to be heads down doing their work. They can't sort of lift up do networking, engage in these different activities at work because they feel like they're under the microscope and they have to be working harder. In the end, that's a bit of a paradox because that lessens your opportunity for access and opportunity if you're not necessarily doing the networking. The final thing I wanna share in terms of enablers is work, our work accommodations. These are a variety of different uh, job flexibility arrangements, work hour arrangements that organizations have put in place to enable individuals to be able to balance their personal and professional lives. And one of the things that you will notice on this uh, data is that black women are the least likely to take advantage of any of them. Um, and this, get, this speaks to, if you look at none, uh, black men and black women uh, are by far um, more likely not to take advantage of any of these. And in our interviews with uh, black executives, they've often talked about, look, I don't have the luxury to be able to uh, not work towards a promotion or limit my travel or, or change the flexibility of my uh, life and my work arrangements because I'm um, being scrutinized, I'm being analyzed, I don't feel like I have the same latitude as everybody else as I pursue my career. One final thing we looked at in terms of the data, and then I'll share with you some of the senior executive women uh, information, is the impact of gender and race on uh, one's career. And we asked individuals, what did you think the impact of the gender was going to be, your gender was going to be uh, when you left HBS and then looking back on your career? So retrospectively looking back, was it an advantage? Was it a disadvantage or was it neither? And you can see, you know, black men and white men largely saw their gender as an advantage or neither. Interesting, there's a small subset of white men who see their gender looking back on their career as a disadvantage. I think this represents some of the backlash about uh, against diversity that we've seen come up uh, in some of the political discourse. Uh, but black women and white women largely saw their uh, gender to be a disadvantage and largely experienced it that way. And then in terms of race, uh, similarly, Black men and Black women felt that their race was going to be a disadvantage. Black men didn't experience it as much of a disadvantage, but Black women experienced it the way that they expected um, coming out. Again, you see a little bit of a difference with white men here. I think that goes to some of the backlash that we've seen about uh, diversity um, writ large. I have experienced more discrimination as a woman than as an African-American. There may be other experiences of racism, but it was never as overt as sexism. I think being a black woman, I feel like we're always trying to walk the line of not being too assertive and not coming across angry. Being one of the only black people, much less black women, and being as outspoken as I think I am, I always felt pressured to dial it back. And so what I want to share with you in closing is some of the deep dive that we did into senior executive Black women. This was actually the first research that we did coming out of this focus on the Black experience. And one of the things that we did is we built, as I said, this database, this 1,381 Black alumni um, over the last 40 years. And what we uh, then uh, did, similar to what uh, Africa.com and their colleagues have done to come up with the list, we went through the screening process to figure out, okay, what was a top executive position? So not just C-level, but managing partner, managing director, looking at the different various roles to see what, uh, who of our Black graduates, men and women, have reached a top executive position. And what we can see from this uh, particular data, there were 532 Black women who graduated from HBS over the last 40 years, and only 67 met it to the top executive position, so a 13% uh, rate. Uh, so we could tell the, the story of the 87% that don't, and I think some of the data that I have shared previously show some of that uh, uh, information. But we really wanted to 
understand these 67. So we reached out to all 67 and asked them to share their experience. How did they beat the odds? How did they become uh, one of these individuals who was able to succeed? And one of the things that they told us um, right off the bat was that I'm an anomaly. There's only one of me that, or there's very few of me in the organization. And so I have to navigate this hypervisibility versus invisibility conundrum. On the one side, I'm hypervisible because there's so few of me in the organization that um, I'm under the microscope. I'm expected to perform at a particular level. All eyes are on me. And so that puts this tremendous pressure on me to represent my race, my gender, et cetera. On the other end, I could be very invisible because there's so few of me um, that I can you know, fly under the radar. I can get, un, uh, I will be uh, less noticed. I'm not going to get feedback. I'm not going to get opportunities. And so you see these different women navigating this hyper visibility versus invisibility conundrum. And it's interesting. Some women that I spoke to said, look, I'm going to step into the spotlight. If you're going to put me on the microscope, you're going to make me hyper visible, then I'm going to get something. There's going to be a quid pro quo. You know, you want this from me to represent uh, the organization in a particular way that I want this from you. And other women actually just flew under the radar and said, look, I'm going to be a little bit stealth on this and navigate my career a little bit differently. When you start with the wind in your sails and the presumption that because you look a certain way and you're a white male, you get to start with credibility. So you get to work away from that. You get to make a few mistakes. I don't have that luxury. And so what we saw these women talk about in terms of their beating the odds were four different things. One was emotional intelligence, one was authenticity, agility, and resilience. With emotional intelligence is with the sense of self-awareness, understanding the context, reading the room, being able to deal with a lot of microaggressions. And I, I hate putting some of this up here because a lot of this puts the onus on the black woman to navigate the situation. In reality, that is true. Uh, organizations should not should be creating the context where people can be more authentic and step into themselves and not have to deal with this. But in the reality, a lot of the women talked about, I, I really had to build my emotional intelligence. I had to really build my agility. I had to really understand the dynamics, understand where I could uh, make my move. And so one woman said, look, I, I use the low expectations to my advantage. I asked to go to senior executive meetings. I absorbed all this information. Uh, I soaked it in and then I used that to my advantage uh, to move up in the organization. And then there was this, what we've seen is a big change over the years about when do I step into authenticity? When do I get to be my full self? And so I think women from the 70s and 80s, uh, and even the early 90s talked about not feeling necessarily that the organizations were receptive to the stepping into authenticity and they had to read the cues in the environment to decide when do I step into uh, this particular um, sense of who I am. Um, and then all of this led to the sense of resilience, this ability to deal with adversity, to be able to uh, uh, push forward, uh, realizing the obstacles that were uh, in their way. And so this was a lot of what the women had to do on their own. And as I speak to organizations about what they can do to create the scaffolding and the infrastructure that actually supports a different environment, it doesn't necessarily rely on the woman to do all of the work uh, to be able to navigate her own success. Uh, a number of things are, are on this slide, but the thing that was most important to these women were the ability to cultivate and develop these mentors and these champions and not just benign mentorship, right? And so men mentorship is, yes, this is how you navigate this organization. They really wanted champions, people who would give them opportunities, who would have their back. You know, we all have inevitable stumbles. Who's going to support you as you stumble? Who's going to give you that um, frank advice. One of the things that we do know uh, is that Black women and women in general get the least amount of feedback in the organization, the least amount of developmental opportunities, and champions and sponsors are giving them those opportunities, giving those feedback to develop. And so what has changed and what hasn't? So going back to my original motivating questions, not a lot has changed. In fact, our Black MBAs are more like the outsiders than the insiders, even though this is an inside path. There's still a heavy uh, focus on mentorship and sponsorship, a thirst for learning. Uh, our Black graduates are uh, highly educated, have had to go to elite institutions, and there's a heavy focus on uh, resilience. So uh, what I'd like to say is that a lot has changed um, uh, in many ways, yes, but in, in some of the fundamental ways of access and beating the odds, it has not. And so I'm going to stop there, uh, and I'm sorry I went over a little with my time, but uh, 
happy to take any questions or move forward Great. with the agenda. Tony, I'm going to moderate the questions for you. And so I will share with you um, some of the first questions that have come up. One question is um, out of South Africa uh, from Fikile. She asks the question, how do historical events um, play into this? How is it that issues like the social justice movement of the last year, for example, play into the paths of Black women and, um, as they go through their journey in corporate world? And what way do these exogenous factors impact? Yeah, and so you can see that in a couple of ways. You can definitely see that in the 1960s and the 1970s with uh, affirmative action programs and equal, equal, equal opportunity. And you can see organizations doing things. What, what, uh, and then it results in an increase of managerial positions, director positions for people of color, but then it sort of wanes. So one of the things that we've seen with this racial, awaken, racial uh, awakening and this focus on opportunities, lots of organizations have said publicly, okay, we're gonna do something different. We're gonna change um, the way in which we operate. So there's one thing about bringing people into the organization. Uh, and so there's a lot of focus on recruitment, but then the big focus is really on retention. How do you uh, build the scaffolding in the organization? And so the, the jury's out a little bit right now. I've seen the, the momentum sustained. And so I'm feeling positive about that. I've been, um, and my colleagues who are, are studying race have uh, worked with a number of organizations as they're trying to uh, reconfigure the way in which they uh, navigate the policies within their organizations and the opportunities within organizations. So I see some positive momentum. I hope that it continues. Um, these things ebb and flow with these different inflection points. You see this big push. You could see that in the data on HBS. When we've had um, uh, directors who are focused on un underrepresented minorities in our MBA program, the numbers increase. And then the, that position, that person leaves, we don't fill it right away, there's less focus on it, you take attention away from that, uh, and then you, you, uh, the numbers go down. And so this sustained momentum is going to be really important from these exogenous events. Great. Um, Tony, we have a question from Pam Reeve, who's one of the women corporate directors. Um, and one of the questions she asks is, does the data indicate the most effective things that white allies can do to be supportive to black women in their journeys? Some are worried about being patronizing or offending in some way, not truly understanding doing to, due to the vast differences in work life experiences. So what can yeah. white allies yeah. do? Yeah, so to me, this gets to that point about, um, you know, the, this, this research that looks at who has access to these senior positions and who a lot of senior positions are path dependent and they're dependent on coaching and development. And what I see with a lot of white senior executives is that they're not giving feedback. They're not getting development advice because they're afraid to be seen as sexist or they're afraid to be seen as racist or they're afraid they're going to be clumsy in their feedback. So they don't actually give feedback. They're like, oh, if I say this about this particular person, they're going to take it the wrong way. And by not giving feedback, but who are you giving feedback to, right? You're probably giving feedback to your white colleague. And so what David Thomas talks about is these two tournaments, right? That you have uh, certain white colleagues that you're biased, predisposed to because you feel comfortable with them. You're giving them feedback. Those individuals are having the opportunity to soak in what you've told them and to course correct where the black women, you're not. And so they're left adrift and they're trying to wonder what's going on. So I, it, I can't stress this enough. So, so one is give that feedback uh, and do it on a regular basis. And even if it's a little bit clumsy, you know, uh, uh, it's uh, vitally important. The second thing is pay attention to what you're asking uh, the black women to be doing. So what I often find, particularly in the United States, is the black women are taking on diversity roles within their organization. They're asked to represent the organization at different events. They're asked to do recruiting. They're asked to doing all of these things that are outside the purview of their job if they're not the chief diversity officer, and most of them aren't. And so are you giving credit for that? because that means that that woman is doing double duty, um, supporting the work that she has to do for her core job, plus supporting all these other things, which she may be very interested in and wants to support, but that takes away from other aspects of what she's being evaluated on. And so as a, a developmental manager, are you taking that into account? Are you thinking about that as well in terms of how you're uh, coaching and developing your, uh, your team? Well, great. Well, Tony, we're going to have to um, cut this short because 
we have so much interest in this topic. Thank you so much for, for your presentation. One person has asked, um, can they get access to the study? And if so, how? So let me leave with that question. Um, yeah, so there's two main sources for the work that we've done. One is the Harvard Business School article, Beating the Odds. And the second is the edited volume, Race, Work, and Leadership, New Perspectives on the Black Experience by HBS Publishing that has a lot of this data as well. Okay, and is it okay with you if we send this out to all the participants? Absolutely, yes. Well, we can do that easily here at Africa.com. We'll take your slides and we will send it out to the list of registrants for this event. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Tony, for all of these insights. As we said, um, you know, we are Africa.com, but no one in Africa has gone this deep in understanding Black women in the corporate space. And so being able to start this conversation with you and the, the deep dive that you've done, I think gives us a lot to think about. And um, in our next panel, we will be talking. Um, we will have four African women CEOs telling us, um, I hope you're gonna stick around to hear what they think of what you've said and what is relevant in Africa and what is is different in Africa. So so that's gonna be the, the coming up shortly. So today we are revealing for the first time who the 50 women are who have made the Africa.com definitive list of women CEOs. And so we've put together a video presentation to reveal these 50 names to you. It has not been released up until this moment. And um, my colleagues have put together a fantastic, if I can brag a little bit, they've done a great job led by Deborah Winter has put together a video presentation to introduce you to the 50 women. Africa.com. The Definitive List The Africa.com Definitive List of Women CEOs celebrates the accomplishments of women who have reached the very top of large, complex listed companies in Africa. Data-driven research with data provided by Bloomberg 24 African stock exchanges Over 1,400 companies to make the list, the following conditions must be met. Listed companies only. Market capitalization over 150 million US dollars. Chief executive of the company. There are three categories within the list. Women who run African companies with market cap over 150 million US dollars. Women who run divisions of listed African companies where the division is valued at over 150 million US dollars on a standalone basis. Women who run the Africa region or an African country of globally listed companies with a market cap of over 50 billion US dollars. Everybody told me that you have no chance to succeed. You know, this opportunity would never have been afforded to my grandmother or possibly my mother. To create a billion dollar product, you need to solve a billion dollar problem. We have 31 power plants spread across various geographical locations. We are incredibly proud of, during the year of COVID, not standing back and saying we're not going to do it. We've done over a trillion in value, a trillion Uganda shillings of loan restructures. We are proud, you know, of the results that we've been able to deliver. There were no female MDs. I think even in Kenya for a multinational, I think I was the first one. My name is Aminata Kandiai and I'm the CEO of Orange, largest telecommunication company in Sierra Leone. Appointed as the first Tanzanian CEO. In my new role as the managing director of Old Mutual Corporate. And now, we reveal who's made the Africa.com 2021 definitive list of women CEOs. We start with regional heads of global corporations, at 50, Daelo Mujapelu, CEO and Vice President, 
British Petroleum Southern Africa. At 49, Mbumi Zigalala, Managing Director, De Beers Group Managed Operations. At 48, Brenda Mbati, President General Electric East Africa. At 47, Angela Kiramatin Jimwa, Regional Head North, East and West Africa, IBM. At 46, Miriam Kane Garcia, Managing Director, South Africa, Total Energies. At 45, Ireti Samuel Ogbu, CEO, Nigeria and Ghana, Citibank. At 44, Kathy Smith, MD, Sub-Saharan Africa, SAP. At 43, Yvonne Ike, Managing Director, Sub-Saharan Africa, Bank of America. At 42, Chantal Omodoni Kagame, CEO, MTN Rwanda. At 41, Aida Diara, Senior Vice President and Head of Sub-Saharan Africa, Visa Incorporated. At number 40, Nunun Jingila, Regional Director, Africa, Facebook. At 39, Lillian Barnard, CEO, South Africa, Microsoft. At 38, Kendi Indigwa Nderitu, Country Lead, Kenya, Microsoft. At 37, Juliet Ehimwan, Director, West Africa, Google. At 36, Teju Ajani, Managing Director, Nigeria, Apple. We continue with Division Heads of African Corporations. At 35, Helene Echevin, CEO, CL Healthcare. At 34, Naniz Adel, CSH Managing Director, Cleopatra Hospital. At 33, Annette Ahern, CEO, PSG Asset Management, PSG Consult. At 32, Kerry Castle, CEO, Financial Services Sector, Motors Holdings. At 31, Aminata Kane Ndiaye, CEO, Orange, Sierra Leone, Sonatal. At 30, Ramatulaye Diallo Shagaya, Managing Director, Orange Finances Mobile Services, Sonatal. At 29, Hannah Siddiqui, Bidvest Financial Services CEO, a subsidiary of Bidvest Group Limited. At 28, Prabashni Moodley, Managing Director, Old Regional Corporate. At 27, Karen Land, Managing Director, Personal Finance and Wealth Management, Old Mutual. At 26, Yoli Swapasa, CEO, General Entertainment and Connected Video, The Multi-Choice Group. At 25, Naveen Wefki, President of Corporate Credit and Investment, Commercial International Bank. At 24, Vivian McMenamin, CEO, Mondi, South Africa. At 23, Kanye Samkize, CEO, Sunlam Corporate. We conclude with CEOs of African Corporations. At 22, Neka Onyali Ikbe, Managing Director and CEO, Fidelity Bank. At 21, Nasim Devji, Group CEO and Managing Director, Diamond Trust Bank. At 20, Diane Karusisi, CEO, BK Group PLC. At 19, Miriam Bensala Shakron, VP and Managing Director, Olmez. At 18, Rebecca Miano, Managing Director and CEO, Kenya Electricity Generating. At 17, Mercia Gacy's, CEO, SBN Holdings Limited. At 16, Amelia Biati, CEO, Liberty 2 Degrees. At 15, Jalila Mezni, CEO, Societe Diatikla Hygienique. At 14, Jackie Van Niekerk, CEO, Attack Limited. At 13, Giabe Pego Mushahani, Managing Director, Absa Bank Botswana Limited. At 12, Anne Zhuko, CEO, Stanbic Bank Holdings. At 11, Mansa Nete, Chief Executive, Standard Chartered Bank. At 10, Catherine Lissetzedi, Group Chief Executive Officer, Botswana Insurance Holdings. At 9, Natalie Algir, CEO, Central Danon. At 8, Ruth Zaipuna, CEO, NMB Bank. At 7, Leila Furi, CEO, Johannesburg Stock Exchange. At 6, Helena Conradi, CEO, Satrix 40. At 5, Jane Karugu, Group Managing Director and CEO, East African Breweries Limited. At 4, 
Miriam Olusanya, Managing Director, Guaranteed Trust Bank Limited. At 3, Lise Lambrecht, CEO and Executive Director, Santam. At 2, Mbumi Madisa, CEO and Executive Director, Bidvest Group. At number 1, Natasha Filyun, CEO, Anglo-American Platinum. We congratulate the Africa.com 2021 definitive list of women CEOs. For more information on training opportunities and a host of ways Africa.com is supporting the goal of getting more women to the top of African corporates, visit us at the definitive list.africa.com. Congratulations to the 50 women who are on the Africa.com definitive list of women CEOs. Now we're going to hear from four of these women. Um, I'd like to introduce them to you. Um, we'll start with Juliet Huan, who is the director of West Africa for Google. Jane Karuku, who is the CEO and group managing director for East African Breweries. We have Taylor Mojapelo, who is the CEO of BP Southern Africa. And we have Prabhashini Moodley, the managing director of Old Mutual Corporate. Thank you, ladies, for joining us here today. We appreciate your presence and the time and energy that you've spent in um, learning more about the, the presentation that was made earlier. We've shared the slides with you in advance, and we hope that we're going to um, learn from each of you. So why don't we start with Juliet? Um, Juliet, I'm going to ask you, tell us about the key milestones in your uh, career that's taken you to the top of Google for West Africa. Um, and then tell us what you think of the conclusions that were made from Tony's presentation. And tell us, is it different or is it the same in Africa? What does it take to get to the top in Africa? Juliet, over to you. Thank you very much, Teresa. And just to say how great it is to be here. I'm in great company. And uh, to acknowledge Africa.com for putting this together. When I think through my journey, so my career has spanned the globe. And I have found myself a minority in many cases, either by race or by gender. And um, there are a few things that just uh, really stand out when I think through. Now, um, you know, thinking through one's career, there are many things that go into, um, you know, pro progression. There are, you know, the, the role of great managers, great teams, networking. Uh, but I'll focus on um, individual attributes that just really um, also just help me to push forward. So I would say from very early on, one of the strengths I had that served me was very strong internal motivation. I had a very clear vision to be the best I could be. I wasn't exactly sure at the time what that would look like down the line, but whatever was in front of me, I gave my all to. And so I set the bar really high for myself. Um, I was always quite driven and self-motivated. And um, the impact of this was that it was just possible to look beyond the limitations around me and set my sights on the on that uh, vision that I had for myself on possibilities because the road wasn't necessarily always rosy. Um, there were disappointments, there were setbacks, but I just had to keep going because it wasn't about anyone or those things. It was about a contract I had with myself, right, that I would rise and shine. And so it was about... What was your very first corporate job? So I started my career in oil and gas. I was working at Shell in, uh, in, the, in the telecoms department. So that was my first corporate job. And at that time, that job, yes. how did you get that job? So um, I, I read computer engineering in my first degree and, um, and I graduated with uh, first class honors and um, Shell at the time had a very, very uh, structured uh, graduate recruitment uh, program. So I was, I applied and um, I was invited as, as, as part of um, that process. And uh, going through that, I was offered a place in the organization. And at the time it was uh, in that environment, it was one of the, you know, one of the great best jobs to have, right? Um, one of the things that I've also, when I look through my career, one of the things very present is just the fact that I haven't played it safe. I have taken on risks and I have been very open to take on new challenges. So uh, I left Shell after um, a couple of years, which was uh, uh, seen at the time as a, a very strange decision. 
but I wanted to develop myself further. I, I, I took on graduate studies. Um, I went to um, uh, uh, Cambridge at the time. And then following that, I got a, a, a job at a global multinational. Um, and uh, again, you know, six years after that, I really, um, I ventured into entrepreneurship because I, I felt a pull to just really leverage technology in driving growth and development and transformation on the continent. So I've had to really just stretch myself out of my comfort zone at different points and make decisions that uh, pivoted my career in a certain way. And those ultimately were very enriching because it built confidence in myself that I could do things, I could, I could make things work, I could take on new challenges and make them happen. If there was a black box in front of me, it wasn't uh, daunting because I knew I could learn, that I could build capacity. And also in all of these as well, given that uh, you know, through the experience, I was uh, embracing new cultures and different environments, there was a certain amount of emotional intelligence that I, I just really had to um, develop in myself to understand the nuances, right? And the peculiarities of the different environments and the people that I was... Uh, um, so that, that's something that... You know, on in his remarks and the importance of emotional intelligence that black women who get to the top seem to have extraordinary black um, emotional intelligence yes and you work with different corporations with different um cultures that corporations owned by shareholders in different parts of the world and can you tell us a little bit more about what it means to use that emotional intelligence in these different environments yes i think it's very important because these are unfamiliar environments. These are new cultures. And in every environment you find yourself, you need to be able to become part of the team, to become an integral part of the organization, to speak the language, you know, to be part of the culture. And so that emotional intelligence that just really helps you, gives you that extra eye to understand people, to understand those nuances, um, to, to, to be able to also just uh, understand the different tenets of the culture. I think that's really important. It's important in helping you to be able to collaborate effectively. It's important in helping to communicate effectively and just really being part of, of the team. Do you think you were born with that emotional intelligence or is this a skill that you've developed over time? I would say it, it's a skill I developed over time. I think, um, and it was also really based on that drive because for me, failure was not an option, right? I had to make things work. So that drive and the, the vision I talked about earlier just really forced me to do whatever it took, right? And so even, even the decision to place myself in environments that were, that, that were unfamiliar, that was also fueled by that drive and that vision, right? And so just really, you know, understanding that, well, this is new and I have to, I have to learn and I have to um, uh, exercise new muscles. I have to, uh, you know, listen and, and, and all those things. Um, that really built over time. Okay, so we heard a lot about what a global audience, a bit American, but global, um, what it takes to get to the top as a black woman. We've had a poll that says that um, clearly there's a very strong statement being made that it's harder to get to the top as a black woman in Africa versus elsewhere in the world. Um, I don't know how you voted in that poll. Um, so let me ask you that question. Do you agree? Or were you one of the people who said it's harder? Yes. What do you think makes it harder? So I think um, one is just the, the social and cultural context that we, um, that we have in this environment. I think to succeed as a woman in this environment takes a certain level of boldness, right? You know, boldness to just take a stand for who you are and who you envision yourself to be. To so take a stand to uh, you know about deserving a seat at the table to take a stand to show up to take a stand for being visible right and some of that requires just going over um you know societal or cultural norms that may seek to bring women down because in this are in, in this culture in this region there are still um nuances there are still stereotypes right that are not really of service to women 
And so uh, it, it, it does require a certain level of boldness to just really, you know, step out and say, you know what, this is who I am and this is what I'm here for. Okay, great. We're gonna come back to you, Juliet. I'm gonna move on right now to Jane. So Jane, tell us, give us some of the key p moments in your journey to reach the top of East African brewers. Yeah, so thank you very much, Teresa, and thank you for having us. I think it's a great platform. And like Juliet said, I think we're in great company. So I think I'll start by ensuring that I had a good education. Now, I'm not sure whether it was about me or my parents, but I think that gave me a right to play and a, and a right to participate in what I'd call corporate Kenya. So after I graduated from university, I had the first job. I'll try and follow the line of questioning. I think I'll appreciate being second. Uh, so I started my corporate job as a dairy production supervisor. And I think the things I learned in that job was the power of discipline, the power of focus, and, and the power of just working with teams to grow my own influence and influencing around me to things that I really felt that I wanted. And I guess at that time, I also met great role models, and they were not necessarily women because there were no women. It was guys, and I kind of liked the feeling of being at the top. So, so I guess uh, from that time, I've done another maybe five other corporates. I've, I've worked in a meat company. I've worked in a telecoms company. I've worked in a dairy and in a chocolate company for a long time. And finally, East African breweries for the last uh, seven years or so. And I think if I look back at what has supported me, because I think it's, uh, it's support really, from various quarters. I think one is just getting people around you who support you and make sure that you're stand, ensure that you're standing on them and they are gracious enough to grant their support for you to perform because as a woman, if there is no performance, you're in trouble. So the first thing I think once you're in the door, which education gives you, is then to continue performing. And then the other thing is having a great leading squad. I think I've been lucky right from my parents, my siblings, my immediate family, my husband, my kids, and lots of uh, other friends, great cheerleading squads to keep you energized and encouraging you to get on, even when things are looking not, not so bright. I think the other thing is, I think I'm lucky to work for, and for organizations that uh, probably take this uh, agenda, diversity and inclusion deliberately, and therefore offer you great platforms to excel, whether it's giving you a mentor, a coach, or that visibility uh, that Tony, Maya, Tony was talking about in the presentation. So I think Diageo... Do you think that you've had hyper-visibility as a woman, especially in the brewing industry? Has there been a focus on the fact that you're a woman, you, you're seen more than others? Certainly. Certainly you always be the old one. You don't really think like a soft one. But, and I think that gives you pressure because you have to make sure that you're delivering to the to what is expected of you. So you have to work extra hard. As a woman, also remember you're a mother, so you also have a lot more complicated life in terms of balancing all that. Because if you don't get the first things right, you just crumble or collapse. And I think the other thing that uh, Juliet said is uh, there's a lot of uh, bias around you. So sometimes it's unconscious bias, even from yourself, because you might lack self-belief. So you have to deal with that. Do you believe that you can be at the table as equal as anybody else. Then the other one is around you, either your superiors or your colleagues or the total ecosystem. Is there some, is there some unconscious bias? And then how do you deal with it? And I think uh, so long as you're aware that those things are going to be serious headwinds, then you need to be mature enough and come to the party and say, I'll hear them, but I'll not pay attention to them. I expect they'll be there, but I'll not pay attention to them. So in a way, I, I keep saying, I try to be, uh, naively optimistic, and uh, uh, to me, I mean, and just imagine that nobody is thinking of me that way. But if I can be, I have the right to be at the table like everybody else. I'm going to try and deliver to what I've been asked to do. I'm going to create networks to support me in doing these things, and I'm going to be asking questions of me and others in terms of uh, how I'm doing, and be ready on the chin to sometimes take some very tough feedback and sometimes very strong tough pats on the back as you go along. Now, Jane, you, you touched on something, you know, we, we've, we're in the middle of our listening tour and speaking to all of the 50 women on this list. 
um, they've all given permission for their interviews to be made public. And one of the things that has been very surprising is this notion of the imposter syndrome. So many of the women have said, I question whether I am at this, whether I'm qualified to be in this seat. Many have talked about how men lean in. Men feel if they only have 50% of the qualifications for a job, they can go for the job. But a woman feels like she has to have 100% before she can go for the next job. Can you talk about whether you've leaned in in this way? Have you been given opportunities ahead of when you were fully qualified? You know, how does that play into your success? I think I've been lucky and I think uh, I think it's part of what I was calling the cheerleading squad. So I've had a boss who's really thrown me into the deep end when I was a young lady. And I think I was sharing with you. I was barely, I must have been a young 20 something and um, I was asked to lead a group of 250 men or older than me. And I had quickly to grow up in terms of how do you influence, how do you bring them to your side in terms of making them your allies or really making the system work for you. And I remember I had to shift my own view of the world in terms of um, what does it take for somebody to come to your side? And I learned that uh, you need to get onto their shoes and then you can work together. And I think once you're aware of where you're coming from, where they are coming from, I think you can enroll them to your side. And, uh, but I think to your point is uh, probably all of us can do very great things, but we have this fear because A, we don't even know how to approach. So sometimes learning by experimenting as you go on, sometimes I refer to it, getting mentored by the ecosystem as you go on mentoring on the go, because you learn a lot of things of how to do things. That probably if you sat by yourself in a corner in a room, you'd never know how to resolve them. So sometimes we need those mentors, we need those organizations, we need those parents, we need those, those friends or, or, or coaches to throw us in the deep end. And I'm sure we'll swim very swiftly out of the challenge. And then so become great swimmers in the long, yeah. That was a, I know your story well, Jane, and that was a critical moment for you. I mean, to be a young woman in Kenya, in your 20s, put in charge of 250 men in a manufacturing, um, you know, and that's just unusual. That doesn't happen. That was obviously something that propelled you to where you sit today. Who made that decision? How did you get into that space? I think, I think it's being in an organization that deliberately looks for raw talents. Uh, because I remember my boss saying, I can see three things in you. You have the drive, the energy, and the judgment, but we need to test you so that you can be ready for greater things into the future. So I think an organization that deliberately identifies key talent that they can drive forward, I think that works. And I think it's going to help us even within this agenda we are discussing today. So I'm a beneficiary of somebody being, or an organization being very deliberate at growing me to grow some competences required for great leadership roles. And I must say, I got that when I was in my twenties and I'm still getting that now, even now late in life within the organization where I work. I work for an organization that is very deliberate in terms of growing diverse talent across the world. So part of the success is choosing the right employer. I absolutely, I, I think there is, uh, I think Tony talked about the place. And for me, as he was talking, I was thinking, you can be in a place that where, however hard you work, however self-aware you will be, you may not thrive. So I think part of it is if you're lucky to work for an organization that really, really appreciates uh, the nature of the world uh, right now and that diversity drives performance, I think it makes you succeed as well as you give back to the organization in terms of the performance and the commitment towards the organization. So place is important. Unfortunately, let's say like in Africa, the choices are not so many, but I'm sure within there we can have some, we have some stars who are in right organizations that is going to change this equation in terms of representation. Now, I think that's a very important point that you make, Jane, is that you've got to choose the right employer because if you're in the, in the wrong place, you may not be given opportunity. If you're in the right place, it can change everything. So very, very important point um, for those who are listening and wanting to learn from, from your wisdom. I think that's a huge point. All right, well, we're gonna come back to you. So let's move now. We're going to go to Tyler. How are you today? Good, thanks, and you? 
Good. I've also had the benefit of doing the listening tour with you, so I know a bit about your story. Um, tell us some of the key moments that um, have, have put you in the position to be the head of BP Southern Africa. Okay, I think I'll start with a bit of uh, vulnerability and just take it back to my younger years, and then I'll just fast forward into um, the present day. So if I just start, I think uh, the first moment was when I was probably about 10 years old, and uh, I was in primary school, and in those days, um, we had performance rankings. And um, I was um, at the end of the year, I got home, and I was not in the top 10. And I was always the first, second, or third. So what naturally happens at that point, um, my parents were very disappointed with me and I had my privileges taken away. But, you know, as I reflect back, that was very harsh from them, but I don't think they knew any better because, you know, they would have expected drive from me and, um, you know, self-management even at any age. But what that did was it taught me very quickly my strengths and weaknesses and how to play to my strengths. And by the way, that never repeated itself. <laughs> and it was a moment of failure. The second was probably more devastating for me, but the key thing was how you get out of it. Um, I've always wanted to study at a, an Ivy League university or a top UK league university. And so I applied for, I mean, I started my undergraduate, uh, got top marks, and I applied for a Rhodes Scholarship to go and study at um, Oxford University. I made it to the top three, but I didn't get it. And I remember crying inconsolably about, you know, this failure. I quickly dusted myself because I always remembered, you know, my dad would say to me, you need to take control of your life. If you don't do that, life takes control of you. So you learn very quickly that you have to pull back and, you know, get up and, you know, recover from your failures. I then went and, uh, you know, worked on plan B and I managed to get a scholarship to go to Cambridge University. And that's how I ended up um, in one of the top uh, UK universities. What that taught me as well was, you know, you will get into the workplace and you will have setbacks and you need to continue to work through that. And it builds resilience. Um, I got into the workplace and at that time in South Africa, um, I think boardrooms understood that they needed to transform, but the will was not there. And by the way, not much has really changed now. Um, but I think the journey, people are conscious of it and the journey is ongoing. But again, there are biases that we have to be aware of. But along the way, I had quite a few mentors. And you know, in this journey, the one thing I became very aware of was to be honest with myself and tell my story the way I best know it. And part of it, part of being honest is really about acknowledging that while you work hard, and I think many of us around here work very hard, but if you don't harness the power of networking, the power of mentorship, sponsorship, that often leaves people, you know, falling off the rails or making choices of, you know, leaving the corporate environment. And I had great mentors, I recall, um, when I worked at Kellogg's, there was a great African leader, um, he's now based in Dubai, a gentleman by the name of uh, Gerald Mahinda. And um, he had actually worked in the breweries in um, East Africa. And um, he was working here in South Africa. And the one thing he said to me is, Tyler, you work very hard, but you actually have to harness the skill of making sure that your work is known and people actually recognize and that you have a sponsor around the table who actually you know, can speak up for you when you are not there. And uh, that has been a journey. Fast forward to BP, I think I've been very fortunate to have worked for an organization, but again, it speaks to being deliberate about choosing the type of organization. I remember, you know, when I was speaking to, um, you know, to the people that were appointing me, the one thing I also wanted to check was, you know, whether diversity was important. And I remember having a conversation with um, the chair I work at Tandio Lin. She does a lot of work um, empowering women in South Africa. She's actually leading that space. And I actually felt inspired. And my predecessor was female, so black female, but black African female. And I thought, this is the organization to work for. Very transformed, a lot of work having been done in the transformation space. And that actually 
is also a determining factor to you know the success that you have. So I think we all need to recognize that you know to get to the top is not all about your hard work, and it's probably more um, about developing the networking skills and also identifying who the right person is to speak for you. But then one has to recognize that you have to work probably twice as hard in Africa because the environment is not kind. And if you get a sponsor, that person needs to want, needs to, you need to give the person the tools to be able to speak for you without any shadow of doubt. And that means as a woman, you work twice as hard. And unfortunately, many of us, for many of us, our cultural contexts are actually built on prevailing patriarchy. And that creates a bit of a, an identity crisis in some cases. And you constantly have to thrive through that. And you can't do that without constant men mentorship and sponsorship. Oh, great wisdom there. Um, you know, so I take it that we know how you voted in the poll, if you are allowed to vote, that it's harder in Africa than elsewhere for a black woman. Yeah, I think it's harder. And the reason why I think it's harder is um, because patriarchy is present. But I must say there are some countries um, different countries where women are rising and those women are leading the charge in making sure that the right policies are set and that there is recognition. But I think what tends to be disappointing is that we've got less men. And I think we need to do a bit more advocacy on getting men to actually start leading that agenda because they own the biggest, the bigger piece of the pie, you know, the pie around the table. Um, and they need to be the ones who are actually creating an environment where women can come in and thrive. So it's about recognizing equity and not only equality, because we will be different and we will have different needs. But again, you're not looking for exceptions, but you actually want to be recognized as an equal player in that uh, corporate environment. Natalia, you make a comment that some countries are taking a lead. You're sitting in South Africa. Is South Africa one of those countries that's taking a lead where women are taking a leadership role? I probably wouldn't say so. I think, um, you know, as I look at some countries that I read about, and because I'm not in those countries, I think uh, East Africa is doing quite a good job in that space. But I think South Africa recognizes, so the policy space is very clear. We want to make sure that we have 50-50 representation. However, I think the challenges that we face are back again to the cultural context that you're talking about. So while we, while we want to drive that, I think the environment and our lived experiences tends to be a lot different, but it is actually a good start that the policy environment is where it is. Great. We're gonna move on to Prabhashini now. Um, Prabhashini, um, you know, one of the conversations that we had that uh, inspired us to do the listening tour was the conversation with Prabhashini. Um, I want to, you know, again, underscore how, how enlightening these discussions are. Now, Prabhashini Moodley, I want to just give everyone some context. Um, she's at Old Mutual, large financial services company in South Africa, 10 billion in revenue in this company. Um, she leads a division that is about three and a half billion in revenue, if I remember correctly. Um, they have two divisions. I, I feel like I'm doing a commercial for um, Old Mutual, but I really believe this in my heart. So I just want to put it out there that this is one. she was the reason that we decided to include division heads because we realized that this big company, while their CEO wasn't a woman, they're 10 billion in revenue and they have two divisions that together equal about 6 billion in revenue run by women. So the majority of the revenue at this large institution is run by divisions, run by women. And Prabhashini is one of those. I also want to point out that when we spoke to her and told her that she made this list, when we talk about the imposter syndrome, she said, really, me, I'm on this list? And this was shocking to me. It's like, look, woman, you're doing such amazing things. Of course you are on this list. So let, let's hear from you, Prabhashini. Uh, let's get your mute off and um, hear about the, the milestones in your journey. <laughs> thanks, thanks so much, Teresa. And I, and I think before I get into it, and just to echo, you know, what many of the other panelists have said as well, I think well done to you and to Africa.com for this initiative, you know, lifting the profile. 
um, of women in, in corporate Africa and shining a light, I think, on, you know, a theme that's becoming even more important uh, as we live through the pandemic and, and try to address some of the very complex issues that we face um, in, you know, on the continent and, and in the world. Um, I'm going to do a little bit like Taylor and go maybe even further back than, than when I was 10 years old. Um, so I, I think of myself as an Indo-African person. So, you know, acknowledging my Indian origins, my great grandparents, um, so more than 100 years ago, you know, came for the promise of, you know, they had a dream for something better. And they traveled from India to the east coast of um, South Africa. And that's where um, I was born and I, and I grew up. Um, but at the same time, you know, <clears throat> and, and many people have said it's harder for, for women in Africa. And I voted, you know, I would have voted it's the same. Um, because I, I, my impression, maybe just my own experience, I would have said it's harder. But, you know, paying attention to Tony's talk, it seems, you know, women in the US who've gone to, you know, Ivy League schools, gone to Harvard, you know, also seem to face um, a lot of difficulty in, in, in just navigating the complexities of the corporate world. Um, so that's, that's my perception. It, it might actually be the same. Um, <clears throat> so while we say it's harder, um, you know, and, and as the fourth daughter in a, in a family of immigrants, an Indian family, I actually feel incredibly fortunate that I was born on the African continent. Um, because if one, you know, just reads up about India and um, some of the hardships and I think the societal inequalities that um, girl children on the Indian subcontinent um, still experience, you know, female feticide is an issue. There are villages in India where no girl children, no girl children are born for years. And, and that's unfortunately because the families are so desperate to have a boy child and don't believe that girls have the same potential. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm actually feeling very grateful that I was born in Africa and my great grandparents took the risk and, and chased, a, chased a dream. Um, and I think, you know, my parents, um, from the time we were very little, uh, for my sisters and, and myself, they drilled into us, you know, the importance of hard work, a good education, be financially independent. Um, and just continuing that theme, I think that theme's been big in my life and, and getting emboldened by the career choices of, of my sisters. Um, so they went, you know, statistician, mathematics teacher, um, a medical doctor. And, and then I decided, okay, you know, I'm going to dream big. If they were able to do this, I could do something, something you know, different. Um, and I decided to get into, into financial services and actuarial science. And I'd never met an actuary, I'd only read about it um, in, in sort of Maths Digest. So it was, quite, it was quite an interesting experience. And I think for the first time when I left home and went to university away from home, I was in an environment where brown people were in the minority. <laughs> and it was the same for the first few years of work. Um, and, you know, when I think back, they were extensive from a learning perspective, um, it was fun. It was more diverse than the environment I'd grown up in. Um, but it was also demanding from an academic perspective, and it was it was quite stressful. Um, so, again, you know, the other the other thing when I reflect that was possibly a large milestone in in my in my career and my my path. Um, other mentors and sponsors I had along the way. Um, almost, or not almost, every single one of my line managers throughout my career has been male. <laughs> but they've all been, and, and I do reflect on that and think I've been working 20 years. Why have I not been able to do the good hard work that I do <laughs> for a woman boss <laughs> and make her look good? I haven't had that opportunity in my 20 year career. Um, I've always worked, uh, you know, for male line managers, but They've been incredibly supportive um, and, you know, uh, encouraging. And I think, you know, I think back to some small instances where someone in a very senior role um, takes the time, you know, or took the time uh, to engage me on my ideas and, you know, saying something as simple as, do you think you can do that? And then, you know, me saying, no, I don't think so. And, and that person saying, Yes, you can. You can do that. 
Um, and the words take on such profound meaning when it comes from, um, so, you know, depending on, on who's saying it and, and it has such a lasting and, and positive impact. Um, and I think the, you know, the third thing, and there weren't real, you know, specific moments, um, but just generally, you know, realizing that one has to take care of the whole person. Um, and I've put a lot of pressure on myself in various roles, you know, to really perform and deliver and deliver that 200%. So no one says we shouldn't have appointed her in this role. You know, we, we knew and we gave her this opportunity and, and look, she hasn't delivered. <clears throat> and I realized quite a bit of that pressure is pressure that I put on myself. Um, and it's partially from the environment. You know, over the years, the number of times I've walked into a room where the stakes are high and there's no one else who looks like me. <laughs> um, and it, and it's, quite, it's quite stressful, it's quite daunting. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm really relieved to say, you know, the complexion of the rooms that I walk into now, and, and especially at, at my organization, um, look less one-dimensional <laughs> than they did 10 or 15 years ago. Um, but, you know, even though there are many women from South African financial services on the list, which is incredible, we still have a long way to go. Um, and the representation is nowhere near where it needs to be um, to actually have decision makers in the roles that are impacting, you know, the lives and the communities of the people of which we are a part. Um, and I think the thing that I love, despite all the pressure and the stress that comes with a very senior role um, at, a, at a large corporate uh, organization, is the opportunity to add my voice and the voice, voices of people like me into the debates, into the conversations. And then to be, you know, the one giving those words of encouragement um, to other people who are still on their journey. And how do we, you know, who've made it into the room, we've broken in to, to some of the inner circles, you know, make space for more people. Uh, because I think there is, I mean, there's so much to be done. There's so much opportunity and challenge in Africa. Um, I think the table is big enough. Um, and more women need to be around all tables. Um, and if we, if we, you know, if we, if we manage to do that in a constructive way, um, we'll actually realize there is space for everybody. But we do have to, you know, work through some of the difficult power dynamics and access structures um, that we do have uh, set up in, in the corporate world at the moment. Um, so yeah, just thanks again very much, I think for the wonderful research um, and the opportunity to share, to share a bit of my story. Fantastic. All right, well, let me come back to one of the points that was made from the research and that is around authenticity. Authenticity is one of the barriers we find that women, you know, I think when you look over time, people, women feel like they need to act like men. Black people feel like they need to act like white people. Can you talk about how authentic you've been in your careers as a black woman? How do you bring the authenticity, the reality, your personal experience based on your gender and your race to your job? And how has that affected you? Has it helped you? Has it hurt you? The research says that you must be authentic to get to the top, but do you hide the fact that you've got to leave early to go to your child's school? You know, how do you handle these issues in terms of being an authentic black woman? Anybody want to take that on? I can take that. <laughs> Look, uh, you know, there's an experience I often speak about, and I think it will hit home for many women. Um, you know, I'm a mother. And I don't, my parents don't live anywhere nearby. So, you know, the support systems tend to be challenged. And as I started my career, um, you know, very male dominated environment. I worked for the breweries and it is male dominated. And I was in, a, in an environment, a space where I had just given birth and my son was not in, um, he was struggling as an infant. And I was somebody who had always wanted to behave like the men do, compete with them, you know, because I was raised almost gender neutral. My dad always said, you can do what you want to do. So it then, it, that moment hit when I realized that I'm actually not being too true to myself because I genuinely want 
to perform, but at the same time, I have a responsibility that I don't want to regret 20 years down the line if I neglect. And so what happened is I actually had went to a male colleague and told him my challenge. And he said to me, look, you can't run away from your reality. You need to start accepting your honesty. And that is where authenticity starts. I had a difficult conversation because I thought, okay, it's time for me to leave the corporate environment. And I actually went to my director at the time and I said, this is not working. And we had a very bold conversation about it. And I must say, he actually saved me from leaving corporate. And since then, I actually learned, be honest with your intentions and also accept your identity. I think the challenge that women of color face and mothers as well is you've got the, um, the bias of women of color to deal with and then you've got the motherhood challenge to deal with. Oh, okay, she needs time off, she needs this. How do you actually accept that reality but also recognize that you cannot let go of your responsibilities and find a way of creating a balance? In some instances, it could be that you're going to you know, work late hours. Yes, it's a reality, but at the same time, you, 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 know, you have a responsibility to your children and you try and fulfill that. But it requires you being authentic in your environment and being honest with yourself. And when you start, when you get that, only then will you start showing up truly. And this is where I start talking about work-life integration rather than work-life balance, because you are only one person. And unless you identify with yourself as that one person, you'll be constantly conflicted with, you know, who you need to show up as at work and who you need to show up as in the home. And from, you know, my experience has been that you've got to avoid that because that then creates a further identity crisis when you still have to deal with the biases of being a black African female mother. Thank you, Taylor. And, you know, and I'll give a, a little bit of a, a headline um, teaser to one of the themes that came out and, and Taylor touched on it. Um, one of the things that we found in speaking to these 50 women is how important the parents were in instilling a sense that you could do anything as a child, particularly fathers. Oh, and that's one of the things that came through very clearly. Many of the women on this list had fathers who told their daughters that they could do anything and that was part of what started them down that journey. Um, I'm gonna stick with that authenticity question. Um, I don't know if any of the other three of you want to talk about authenticity. Okay, I, can go. <laughs> I, can go, I, I can go, Teresa. Go, Jane, t talk to us. Yeah, so, so yes, I think, yeah, to your point, my father was probably, and he still is, my greatest supporters. He thinks, I, I think, he thinks I can do anything, and I truly believed him, and I think it made a difference. I think on authenticity, I think for you to be happy, even be happy as a human being, you have to have a proper balance between your organizational objectives and your own personal objectives. And you have to be ready and authentic to call it. I usually call it first things first. Have, have I been perfect? Probably not. But I, just as an example, I stopped working after four and a half years into my career to go and raise a family. And I did that for another four and a half years. And at the time, people thought I was crazy. Looking back now, it's probably the best decision I ever made in my life which then meant when I went back to the office, I could still try to be a great mother and a great wife and a great everything else. But also I, I was freed kind of that I have done that. So my kids are a bit older, so then you can concentrate on this side. And I, th I think that helps. And you have to be authentic all the time. If there is a, a family issue, my principle has always been first things first. And I don't think you'll ever get fired. If you're an organization that, marks you down for trying to be a wholesome human being, then you probably are in the wrong organization. Good point, good point. Juliet, I think you were trying to get in there. Yes, absolutely. I think it's a very important point. And um, also the point about how, how uh, we're, we're raised. Uh, it's interesting. I think three of us started with, um, you know, very early in our careers and, and childhood and, and all of that. Uh, because that's where we get that those belief systems ingrained in us. That's where we're really formed. And I, I feel like um, when we look at the workplace, it's there are a number of there are a number of challenges. You know, on its own, it's challenging enough. But if you're having to put on a certain game face, 
right, that you bring to work all the time, that can be an added layer of stress and can be in incredibly exhausting. And also when we talk about success, it's actually, you know, you know, from my perspective, it's, it's the entire human being, right? So success is not just that I'm at a certain position at work. It is about everything around who I am being and, and my vision and all of that. And if I'm bringing a different self to work, then I'm compromising that. And I think we've made some progress over the years where right now there's a lot more openness to talk about you know, um, diversity and equity in the workplace, uh, the, the role of women, um, you know, talent and so on. And, and, uh, and I think you know, in the past, there were, um, you know, the environment was a lot more challenging where, um, and, and sometimes these, these are just stories that we feel, we tell ourselves and we um, act out because of our perception about what the end result is going to be. If, I, if I'm a certain way or if I um, bring this part of who I am to the table, I'm not going to head, get, get ahead. I'm going to be judged, right? And, you know, in some cases, in certain environments, that's been true. But I think um, we've made some progress now where there's, a, there's, there's some more openness towards looking at diversity of ideas, diversity of talent, and also just respecting and recognizing the unique attributes that different genders bring to the table. So um, some, sometimes the, uh, what we think will happen, right, if we bring our true selves to work, right, sometimes we might find out those things are just in our heads that um, actually sometimes people appreciate it more when you are authentic and you just really, um, you know, stand for what you are and showcase, you know, what's important to you. And so I think definitely, um, you know, as we as we think as we think about our journeys and as we progress, I think it's uh, it's something because women we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. Um, the environment puts a lot of pressure on us. Um, listening to uh, Professor Mayo's presentation as well, you know, it was also you know a, a reminder of just the the amount of effort that we need to put in sometimes, you know, to get to where we are and going the extra mile and all of that. And I think more and more we can step into that space where, you know what, this is who I am, this is what I stand for, and, um, I, you know, I deserve to be here. You know, let me take that point, Juliet, <laughs> and go back to um, Andele, who has written in with a question, talks about the fact that um, feedback is very important. You know, we're talking about women in the corporate sector, and that means getting along with others. That means working within a large, complex environment and getting feedback on how to do one's best in that environment. You may be fabulous, but there are things that you may need to change or to improve in order to succeed in that environment. And this becomes, this is one of the things that Professor Mayo spoke about, is that getting honest feedback, and in particular, let's talk about white men, because that's who dominates the corporate world wherever you might be, um, across the continent, in Africa or the world. Getting honest feedback from white men is one of the important factors we've found for people to be able to succeed. If you're doing something wrong, you need someone to tell you that. Otherwise, you're not going to course correct and move ahead. So one of the questions that Andeli puts out there is, do you have any advice for black women on how to get honest feedback from your white male boss who may not be giving you the feedback that you need. Anybody want to take that on? I can just start off. Um, I think it's really important to, uh, to, to get honest feedback because that's how we grow. That's how we improve. And we can't be very present to all our blind spots. And so it's, uh, you know, and I always say you're not at the receiving end of your personality. Sometimes people hold up a mirror for us that just really tells us something important and useful, especially when, there are, when we know it's constructive and when there are people that we trust. Sometimes we need to be proactive as well in nudging people to get that feedback, right? So just really asking for the feedback and creating an environment where people feel safe and comfortable to give that honest feedback. I know certainly in my career, um, that's something that has been very helpful. And I do remember uh, some specific incidents where uh, just having a very robust, one-to-one -one conversation and inviting feedback 
right? And, you know, creating an environment where it's okay to whatever the feedback is, like, I really want this feedback. I'd love to hear it. And when we talk about white men and, and so on, if you're in an environment, right, where there are predominantly white men, then it's very important that you get feedback because you may not be very present to how you are showing up, right? So, um, so, so I think if the environmental processes and structures don't naturally create opportunities for you to get feedback, then being very proactive in actually inviting that feedback is something that I would I would uh, recommend. Anybody else want to jump in on the feedback comment? Prabhashini? Yeah, if, if I can go, uh, Teresa. I think that's an interesting question because uh, it also talks to, you know, the, the, the person who's, who's senior and if they're feeling secure and comfortable enough and, and cares about your development, you know, then giving you honest feedback shouldn't shouldn't be a problem in a in a constructive way. Um, I, I agree with Juliet, you know, in, in a lot of large, large organizations, you do have very structured processes. Um, so, you know, uh, annual reviews, mid-year reviews, and I think insisting on, on getting that um, from your line manager as well. Um, perhaps another one is on very specific you know, very specific projects or initiatives and, you know, asking, so how did I do on this? You know, instead of making it a, a, a global thing, you know, how do you think I'm doing? Be very specific, you know, on this project, was there something I could have done a little differently? Would you have done it differently? Is there anything I did particularly well? Um, but but I think what's interesting is if, 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 someone, if someone is not comfortable in themselves and, and doesn't care enough about your um, development and growth sincerely, um, it's, it, it can be difficult to get that out. And, and if you don't succeed with your direct line manager, then are there other people in the organization who you interact frequently um, and who you can go to for, for honest and sincere feedback? Um, I would suggest that as well. Yeah, I think Teresa, I can add on to that. And I think I would say you as a woman in particular, you have to go looking for the feedback. And I agree that large organizations have processes, but I think the most powerful feedback is what is informal and on the go. Remember women, there's kind of like um, some bias in terms of how we react. Some people think we are very emotional. Uh, some people think that we can't take hard things. Men are just not comfortable talking to women for all sorts of reasons. So I think you have to force that feedback to come your way. And I think it's related to what Tony was talking about, about self-awareness. And I think the question is, how do you create self-awareness channels to yourself in terms of how you're doing as a leader for the people you lead and in terms of your colleagues or the guys you work for or people that you work for? Because any of those feedback or any of that feedback is going to enable you to probably do better and be a better person or even feel more comfortable within your own skin. I think the other thing I think is also related to emotional intelligence. I think highly emotionally intelligent people are always seeking for that feedback and are very aware, are very aware of where, where their strengths are or where their opportunity areas are. And therefore, always checking on with their friends or with their support system in terms of what they're, what they're doing in terms of that. And I think professionally, you can also get a coach or a mentor. I think it's something worth investing for yourself so that you can have honest conversations where you're secure, away from either your boss or, or those who work for you or away from your colleagues. But I think they say feedback is a, is a, is a fuel for champions. So I think we must all get our feedback. Good. Well, I'm going to end with a, a real meaty question that someone has um, come in with. Um, and again, I want to thank you for being so vulnerable here and in the listening tour. And we're going to go there now. And, and the question that has been asked is, how do all of you successful women deal with the fact that you're CEOs and your husband may not be a CEO? How does that work? How do you make things work in the family context, being such a successful woman in largely patriarchal societies? So who wants to jump in on that one? Can I go first? Because I don't have a husband. <laughs> so that's how it's working for me. <laughs> well, thank you for taking the <laughs> Yeah, so it, it's an interesting one. And, and I think, you know, it's some of the tough choices I've made in my life in, in where, you know, I, I, I really wanted to grow and, and commit time to my career. 
And it does get more difficult as you get older. And I think it is harder with black men. Um, that's my personal experience. And I, I cannot be with someone who is not comfortable with who I am. I, I cannot make myself smaller because me being me makes that person feel, you know, that person must own <laughs> their own sense of worth as an individual. Um, and I, and I, I found that difficult. I find that that difficult um, to find that. Uh, n- not that it's, um, yeah, not that it's been a high priority, but I thought it was easy for me to go. <laughs> and then we can hear from some of the other ladies. <laughs> no, I, I can go. I've been married for quite some time. I got married to a friend. He didn't marry a CEO. At home, I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a daughter. At breweries, I'm the CEO. Good. <laughs> yeah. I think for me, it's really just about friendship. And the way I, you know, describe my relationship is really with just friends and um, try to avoid the husband-wife tags and anybody can do anything. I'm avid gardener, so I go outdoors quite a lot and it's okay. Um, I think the challenge is, or the, the trick is you've got to make sure that your partner um, that you're with recognizes what makes you happy and what you desire to be as an individual. And yes, you are together, but he needs to be your biggest supporter and cheerleader. In the absence of that, it doesn't work. Great advice. Juliet? Absolutely. Absolutely. I would double click on that and on what proper Shini said, excuse me. Um, it's about friendship. And also, um, I don't wear CEO as, a, as an armor, right? I'm just someone who's trying to be the best version of myself. And if that shows up as CEO, that's one thing. It can show up as something else. And so it's about just me shining my light. And it would be grossly uncomfortable and, and, uh, and impossible, really, to dim that light. And so it's just really about you know, um, uh, you know, bringing all of me to the table. And it's about friendship. Well, I think this is a wonderful place. We happen to be right on time and it's a perfect place to stop. Um, Juliet, Jane, Prabhashini, Taylor, I can't thank you enough for being a part of this, um, for sharing the wisdom. This is not usual conversation. I think that the people who have joined us today have taken a tremendous amount from your honesty, your vulnerability, sharing your stories and your assessments of what it's like to get to the top as women of color, black women, Indian African, however you want to describe yourselves in Africa. It's been fantastic to have you do this. And and I really want to underscore that this is not the last time we're going to see the four of you. I've seen a few of you a couple of times already. This is the beginning of some very important work that we intend to be doing for a very long time. And so I thank you for your commitment um, to helping increase the pipeline for African girls and women aim for the top rung of the ladder where you are. Thank you for for contributing to that. And I'm going to thank you in advance for walking this journey with us um, as, as we continue to work on this in the months and years to come. Thank you so much. We have yet another fabulous thing to move straight to. I mean, it's just been such a great day already, or at least that's my perspective. I hope that um, it's, it's, I hope that all of our audience shares my view, but I'm just really excited about what we're about to do now. Um, As I said, we have a thought leadership partner in Standard Bank and the women with whom we work, Silga Busa, Katalejo Maleke, have said to us, why don't we do something around the gender lens investing? And let's look at the surprising role that stock exchanges around the world are playing in advocating for women in senior positions. And so that's what has led to the next panel. Um, We have a fantastic moderator. We have Lerato Mbele, who is with BBC World News, who's going to moderate this panel. Before she starts, we're going to have some words from Anne Alaker, a woman who is the head of investment banking, international investment banking at Standard Bank, who I sure could talk about all the things that we are speaking about on this, um, throughout this discussion today. And then we are joined by four fabulous people who are going to help us unpack this. We're going to start with Mayowa Kuryo, who is a partner 
in the West African Financial Institutions practice at McKinsey. And McKinsey has done some fantastic research looking at black women, particularly in the senior executive roles and boards in Africa. And so she's gonna share some of the insights from that research with us. And then we're gonna hear from Susan Keating, who's the CEO of Women Corporate Directors Worldwide. She's gonna to talk to us about what the NASDAQ has done in the United States in terms of uh, making as a listing requirement that women must be on boards. We're going to hear from Temi Popola, the chief executive officer of the Nigerian Stock Exchange, who's gonna talk about what Nigeria is doing. And we're going to hear from Nkul Niambezi, the chair of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, who's going to talk to us about where the JSC is. And I'm gonna turn it over to you to give us some opening remarks. Anne Alliker, Head of Investment Banking, Standard Bank. So I prepared some words um, and I read a little bit about Professor Meyer's work and I thought that was very inspiring. But listening to the, pre pre um, the last panel, the conversation was authentic, it was refreshing, and I think leads us so nicely into some of the practical hows of how we can um, increase women at a very senior level, particularly on the exchanges in Africa. Some of the things that uh, Prof Professor Mayo spoke about, the women talked about really resonated with me, the concept of resilience, the reference to um, being the only one in the room, people looking like you, the representation all of those women have for all of us, I think is quite important. And the work we will be doing together, I think is fundamental and quite foundational. So I'm really delighted that Standard Bank we partnered with Africa.com and um, really pleased to hear the, the next panel. So Standard Bank Africa is very much our home, we drive for growth. And we truly believe that in order to do so, that it's important that we play our part in ensuring that women and girls enjoy the same rights and access in men and boys. Because this isn't just a fundamental right, but it's a business imperative. Economic empowerment, participation of women at a very senior level. When I look around the table, at the tables at which I sit, I'm often very much the only woman and I am more particularly the only black woman at these tables. And so I think the activist roles that the stock exchanges will be playing, um, will talk about is quite important. Because in the corporate world, we have to develop targets and practices that make gender diversity, equality and parity actually real. The Standard Bank, we're seeing how we do this internally for our staff and how we create enabling environments that are free from bias. And I did hear the panelists talking very much about bias. The practices that will enable us to advance and exceed and enable women to exceed based on the merits and ability. So in Standard Bank, we've done quite a lot. And we've shifted the tone within the organization and quite significantly shifted the number of senior women in executive positions. But it's been slow, it's been arduous. Change is, change feels as though it takes much longer than we'd all like, like it to be. At the moment, about 35% of our board is women up from 20% in 2018. We have a target towards 40% by 2023. And there's a lot of confidence that we'll meet it. But being within the bank, I can feel sometimes how difficult it is to actually get there. So our internal approach to this is very necessary. When it comes to women in the asset management world, and specifically for that, we are, we are supporting women across Africa. And we've registered a foundation to support the Africa Women Fund Initiative, which was launched in partnership with the United Nations and it's aimed at uplifting female-led asset management firms and promoting sustainable growth across the continent. This is important. You may know that on the continent, only about 5% of women asset man fund managers are women, and only about 7% of all private capital is invested in women-owned businesses. This is material. And through the African Women Impact Fund, we intend to raise $1 billion over the next 10 years, for these fund managers to invest in high impact businesses across the continent. I think I'd just like to, like to end by saying that the last 15 years in the group, I've seen Standard Bank move, perhaps not rapidly, towards more consistent implementation of various strategies to achieve gender parity. 
but as with many companies, progress takes place in fits and starts. I'm excited to listen to this next panel, excited to learn about some of the practices that they are implementing and seeing what we can adopt, certainly within investment banking, to achieve gender equity and gender parity. Thank you very much, Teresa. I'd like to hand over to yourself and to Lerato. Thank you, Anne, and thank you to our panelists uh, for joining. Let me just start off with a few of my own interventions, if I may, as an outsider from the financial services and business world, just my own observations. I'm going to present a few names to you. Many of you will recognize them, but um, let's just see how many you do recognize. If I say to you, Kamala Harris, Jacinda Arden, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwaila, um, uh, Sana Murin, um, uh, when we talk about Rose Raponda. These are all women who in the last two years have either been elected or re-elected as presidents, vice presidents, heads of international organizations and prime ministers in their countries. Now I'm mentioning this because it seems as though we are starting to see some kind of a trend globally where voters are making a decision and using their elective rights to choose women to lead them, and not just to choose women, but to choose them during a truly unprecedented time in world history, a time where we all know how society and global economies have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. The choice is that women can lead through these crises. So my question is, this trend that we're starting to see, as nominal as it may be in politics, can it permeate other areas of society. In the last few years, um, the conversation around gender pay parity has come to a head in elite sports like tennis and also football, where we haven't been discussing issues of gender. We're also seeing a trend in Denmark and Ireland, for instance, where younger leaders are being elected and even leaders of a different sexual orientation. So it's not even just gender and gender pay parity issues, but it's also diversity issues and questions of minority rights. So I don't think it's an accident that this year, as a culmination of work that's being done, the NASDAQ has introduced new listing rules and requirements that would take cognizance of the need for gendered perspectives and also the need for diversity interventions in investing. And this is why the conversation we're having here today is so forward thinking, it's so timely. And I hope that as we discuss the role that stock exchanges can play in being activists for women leadership, but also changing the prism of the lens in which investors deploy capital. I pray and I hope it is a useful one for all of us. So without further ado, I am now going to hand over to uh, one of our panelists. She is going to be uh, talking us through some research that's been conducted by McKinsey over the last uh, couple of years, I suppose, uh, work that has been looking at the impact and the trends for women leadership and also for diversity and how it pertains to the world and indeed to the African continent. So Mayawa Koyora, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be uh, with you all this afternoon um, on, on this topic, which is very dear to my heart, which is around sort of gender parity. And I really like this lens that we're looking at it because we don't, as as, uh, as Lorato has mentioned and, and some of the speakers mentioned previously, we don't see a lot of women in the investing world. So it's, it's great to be amongst such great company this afternoon. So what I'm going to do, um, as Lorato said, is just share a little bit of perspective that we've built over the couple of last uh, four or five years around what the gender parity situation is in Africa. As a firm, McKinsey um, in 2017 launched this piece of um, research that looks at what gender parity would mean for economic outcomes. So we tracked um, in 2017, yes, 2017, I think 2017, sort of what that looked like. And then we refreshed the, the, the research about two years ago to say, look, let's see what progress we've made. And we did a specific one focused on Africa. So the first report was global. We then decided to do one for Africa. And the next refresh is going to be due um, next year. So this is based off of 2019 um, um, data. Um, what you see um, on, the, on, on the, the chart is sort of a landscape across uh, the continent around what our gender parity score is. Um, and I'll explain to you what it is in a minute. But you can see that you have um, the South, what I call the South African cluster of leaders, where you have, even at best, across the continent, 
medium inequality. Um, at worst, you have some, some of the West African countries that have quite um, extremely high inequality and the rest of the continent sort of flutters around uh, the high inequality um, um, space. And the gender parity index is essentially a composite looking at gender outcomes um, on two dimensions. The first one is equality at work. And here we have a number of metrics that we track as to, to check how, how women sort of what, what women's outcomes are. And then we have equality in society, looking at things around health, um, access to education, and so on and so forth. On the top right hand corner, you have um, the leaders, and as I talked about um, previously, it's the South African clusters where you have um, sort of relatively, and I use the word relative, right, relatively higher, just relative to the rest of the continent, relatively higher outcomes on work and in society. On the left hand side, um, you have what I would term as a workplace focused um, countries where you have better outcomes for women in terms of parity at work than you do in society. And then the rest of the countries are sort of split into two clusters, the, the, where there is um, sort of very bad outcomes for women, both at work and in society. And then uh, the countries that are sort of middle of the road where they're not really um, sort of uh, distinctive anywhere. And we did, uh, we built an economic, econometric model to say, if in the best in region scenario, if we had a situation where all of Africa was sort of equal in parity, what would it mean for um, GDP? Because people react to numbers, right? And, and one of the things that this research sort of says, it's not, you know, and I, it's not doing good. It's not doing well to, to, to really think about gender parity. It's doing good. And it, it has sort of broader um, economic uh, implications for us. And I think there are three key messages that I would strike here. One is that, you know, by 2025, and we did this research a little bit before COVID um, sort of struck, so the numbers might have changed slightly since then, um, but there is an incremental sort of opportunity of $300 million to Africa's GDP, which is not um, insignificant, right? But the second thing that I think we should also think about is if we carry on at our current pace, and like I mentioned, we had done this research over two periods of, 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 of years, we, it would take 140 years to reach even that 300 billion number at the current pace. And 140 years is essentially seven generations, right? So this is, if we continue at the pace, and I love some of the examples that Lerato gave, but those are sort of singular examples. We need to hear more. You know, we need to have, we have, we need to have more of those sort of examples. I mean, to get more traction for us to begin to move the needle across, uh, across both equality at work and in society. And this is not just an Africa story, by the way. Um, this is something that is a global phenomenon, right? We looked at, like I said, we, looked, we did the work in 2015 and we did work again in 2019. And if you look at equality at work across all the regions, you can see that actually, when you look at it vis-a-vis -vis both years, we'd actually, as a world, sort of um, um, regressed slightly. There were some regions that did better than most, but there were some regions where you had sort of slight, um, slight, uh, 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 reversal in the progress that had been made previously. So the average uh, parity score in gender equality at work was uh, 0, uh, 0 0.5, which is a which is an all it was 0 0.01 percentage increase, which is not a lot. This is we're talking about decimal points to measure increase to, to parity. So there's there's still some work to do, to be done. And now let me talk about Africa and gender inequality at work in Africa. Um, I will just focus your attention on the first two columns. The first column is world average and the second column is Africa. And, you know, if you take a step back and look at it, we, we largely mirror sort of global performance um, at work, right? So um, there are two things that I always talk about. One is um, unpaid care work. And then the second is leadership positions. And this is why we're here. And when you look at it across the world, there's still extremely high inequality right, um, in, in leadership positions for women. So there's still, for me, this, this message is, yes, we're sort of at par in Africa with the, with the rest of the world, but on metrics that matter, on metrics that show the progression, we're still quite behind. And we really need, to, it's not enough to talk about it. It's not enough to write, we need, we need severe action. We need, we need a lot of action to, to change um, the narrative that we have. But there is some good news. Right? It's not all doom and gloom. There is some good news. Africa still has above world average 
um, representation in top leadership roles. But I always think I always say please take this cautiously because we're still not celebrating 50-50, right? We're celebrating 25%, we're celebrating 22%, right? Um, which, is, which is great that we're higher than the rest of the world. However, we're not talking about 50-50. You know, parity is 50-50 and that's what we should be striving towards. And this is driven uh, primarily by Sub-Saharan Africa. So the, 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 the progress that, or, or the leader, leadership position that Africa has, has made in terms of board and sort of uh, executive com committee representation is driven uh, primarily by uh, sort of SSA. Um, and then the other thing that you would see on the, on the final chart is really around um, executive committee roles. Again, you have uh, the Southern African region really sort of pushing ahead there at around 24%. Um, what, when you do the research here, and I think this is another thing that I care a lot about is that when you look at women's roles in executive committees, they tend to have what I would say, what I would call line positions as opposed as opposed to business positions where they're holding P and L and again driving things like investment decisions. So we have, I think we need to celebrate, and I think that's why we have this page here. But we also need to take that into context so that we're not talking about 50-50 representation, and we're not talking about rules that really help to drive business um, outcomes. So what can we do to change this? And a lot of what the previous panel panelists talked about is actually captured here. I think the first thing that I will talk about is investing in human capital. So making sure that we actually raise, um, um, invest in education and raising the skills to ensure that uh, we have women who are in the, you know, who have the right capacity to drive um, the, the, the outcomes we want to see. I think the second thing is really around creating economic opportunities and ensuring that, for example, in our places of work, we have formal mentorship and sponsorship programs for women. Um, you know, there was a question asked about feedback and, and so on and so forth. You can only grow if someone tells you where you need to grow. So I think there needs to be some, some formal um, uh, mentorship programs there. The third really around leveraging technology, which we all know about. I think the fourth one is particularly important in the context we live in in Africa, which is around shaping attitudes, right? And then finally, enforcing laws, policies and regulations. You'd be surprised as to how many of our countries actually have laws that are female friendly, but are just there written and nobody really applies it. So thank you very much. I'll hand over back to, to Larissa now. You know, numbers don't lie, they say. And I think the minute you said it would take seven generations to effect meaningful change that would contribute to more than $300 billion in the economy. For me, that's when the penny dropped. That's what we're really talking about. But thank you for the measured uh, insights as well where Sub-Saharan Africa is making strides at board and uh, uh, oversight levels. Okay, let's get a perspective now from the United States. And by way of introducing to you our next uh, panelist, I just want to read a short excerpt from uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States when they were doing the work that led to the new rules to be introduced this year. So a year ago, the Securities and Exchange Commission said the new listing requirements would require all companies listed on the NASDAQ to publicly disclose consistent, transparent, diversity statistics regarding their board of directors. Additionally, the rules would require most NASDAQ listed companies to have or to explain why they do not have at least two diverse directors, including one who self-identifies as female and one who self-identifies as either an underrepresented minority or a member of the LGBTQI community. And then for foreign companies and smaller companies, the reporting standards are more flexible. Now I'm reading you this just for us to crystallize what is required here when we're talking about investing from a gender perspective and looking and incorporating diversity into the investment agenda. And so by that introduction, I'd now like to hand over to Susan Keating, who is the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Women Corporate Directors Foundation, just to share some insights from the United States. And also, Susan, for you to tell us how companies have responded to these listing requirements. Over to you. Well, first of all, thank you so much, and Lorado, and thank you, Mayor, for that just really very comprehensive research report. Uh, I want to just say in the U.S., McKinsey has been very influential in shaping awareness and opportunities for more diversity on board. So thank you for that. Uh, I am Susan Keating, and with Women Corporate Directors, and just to level set here, 
We are a global organization. We are 20 years old. We have 2,400 women that are part of 76 chapters around the world that today serve on public company or large private company boards. So that's sort of who we are. Uh, and to your point, Murado, NASDAQ has done an extraordinary job of really helping to take a stance that can potentially accelerate uh, sort of where we're headed and basically support what we're all talking about here, which is more diversity, both gender, uh, ethnicity, uh, you know, sexual orientation and so forth on boards. And perhaps to kind of frame this, uh, I'd like to say that in the U.S., as in many other countries, uh, you know, we continue to see a growing recognition of the value of board diversity. And that sort of growing kind of position is what has led to requirements such as the position NASDAQ has taken intended to define diversity, but also increase it. Uh, we were talking earlier in the panel about the fact that this has really been a slow process of seeing progress in Africa. The same is true in the US. Uh, and again, what I would say uh, many of us talk about uh, our progress, even though we have made progress, it has been at a glacial speed. So let me first say that a decade ago, uh, the Alliance for Board Diversity, which is a coalition of groups advocating for diversity, uh, conducted a census that said that companies were really underrepresented in women and minorities, at that point representing only 25% of all Fortune 500 board seats. Also, growing research uh, demonstrated, and again, McKinsey and others, the benefits of diversity, which resulted in companies being urged to really enhance shareholder value by promoting. So this gets back to that point of awareness uh, and sort of engaging companies to think differently uh, about how they are addressing diversity. Uh, if we look at uh, the investors, they actually began putting buying and voting power behind diversity. And then also with ETFs or exchange traded funds, a database was developed which tracks ETF board diversity as does impact assets. So again, another point here, and I, I really am sort of getting to, we have seen an evolution uh, over the past 15 years, shareholders have stepped up. So, so different uh, stakeholders have, have come at this topic um, from a variety of uh, places, but shareholders stepped up, proposed resolutions in support of diversity so today, the number of women and minorities on boards uh, has doubled from 2011 at 44%. So again, this has been slow. However, uh, moving at what many of us would say, uh, again, as I said earlier, at glacial speed. Uh, separate from that, in the US, we've had Congress, we've had the SEC, uh, who has approved NASDAQ's proposal. Uh, we've had... Uh, uh, the New York Stock Exchange, and I'll speak to that in a minute, uh, that has supported uh, and tried to advance diversity. We've had state uh, laws and requirements. All of this has created an active focus that has been very helpful. Uh, not, uh, you know, just recently, uh, you certainly are aware that in the U.S. we've had a lot of racial unrest, particularly following the death of George Floyd. And I would say that really marked a turning point in the long journey to confronting racial and social justice in the US. And so today, uh, companies are rethinking the composition of boards, the C-suites, the workforces. And again, you could see from the McKinsey numbers that the US is, is doing better than most in those categories, but also nominating and governance committees are more intentional about seeking diverse qualified candidates. So NASDAQ uh, is an active champion. And again, this gets back to the point in September 2020, it supported what was called the board challenge, where they were asking boards, this was more awareness, they were asking uh, the boards without a black director to add at least one in the next 12 months. Uh, then in 2020, they actually announced the proposal that you so kindly referred to. And again, the point was to advance diversity and enhance transparency 
through new proposed listing requirements. Now, the rule, which was subject to certain exceptions, would require, again, just as you suggested, at least one woman, one person of color, or identified as LGBTQ over a period of time. And as a part of this, if companies did not meet those requirements, they had to explain why. Uh, also, there was instituted new reporting disclosure requirements. And again, uh, in August of 2021, the proposal was approved with some amendments. And again, NASDAQ's goal was to provide a better understanding of companies' current board composition and enhance investor confidence that all listed companies are considering diversity in the context of selecting uh, directors. So again, the rule requires companies to disclose formally uh, and through a board diversity index. And again, I'm pleased to say uh, this has been uh, well received in the US. It has certainly gotten serious attention on the part of companies uh, who are rethinking uh, their board composition and their commitment to diversity. And again, uh, along with NASDAQ, the New York Stock Exchange, actually, even though they have not taken the same position that NASDAQ has, they some years ago uh, actually created an initiative to advance diversity through their advisory council, which is more around awareness. They have 21 council members that are very vocal, such as David Solomon and Goldman Sachs and others. Uh, so that, along with, again, U.S. Congress has taken positions, states in the U.S. have taken positions, and we see a movement here that we think uh, should be very helpful in our intention of increasing the number of diverse candidates on boards, not only in, in the U.S., but worldwide. Right, Susan, thank you so much for a comprehensive uh, presentation. And um, what I garnered from what you said is there are the rules that are being introduced, but prior to the rules, there was a lot of sort of intuitive, uh, deliberate action that was being taken within the corporates in America to start to realign or change perspective. So I have one question to what you said, which is what can be done to introduce softer targets perhaps that can help companies continue to move in this direction, give it a little bit more momentum? And how do you measure meaningful change? Because it's one thing to meet requirements because it is what the regulator wants. It's another thing to just have change because you know it's the right thing to do. So I would say it really starts at the top. And that's why with women corporate directors, we are very focused on the boardroom. Uh, and if we don't have board members uh, and CEOs in the C-suite taking leadership positions, recognizing the opportunity that diversity represents in these companies, uh, from our perspective, it's kind of a losing game here. Uh, and again, one of the things uh, to your point, Murado, is not only do we have to embed in our strategic work on boards, our plans for supporting and increasing, enhancing diversity, but we have to hold everyone accountable. There have, there have to be true measures of defer, determining what defines success uh, and track that and report it. And, and I would say, you know, it's interesting, not one size doesn't fit all. I mean, companies need to reflect their stakeholders. Uh, and given the diversity of stakeholders, today, uh, it is absolutely critical that we have uh, new and different thinking at the top. And I, I'm going to go back. You mentioned the pandemic uh, and what that has done. Uh, we've talked about the pandemic in terms of the, you know, but what that has done in having um, leaders think differently about their companies, the silver lining here has been most companies are having to transform themselves. There are so many factors coming into play that boards, you have to have diverse thinking to address how best to approach and ensure that these companies survive longer term. 
Okay, thank you for that. I'm now going to turn our attention for a more granular perspective of um, South Africa, which has um, the largest stock exchange on the African continent. But may I urge you as delegates and participants to keep this conversation going via your social media platforms and use the um, at Africa underscore dot com. And I guess let's just make it a hashtag, women in leadership. Let's start talking about meaningful change. And now I'd like to introduce to you the chair of the uh, JSC, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, Nongulu Lego Nyembezi, who's going to just give us a picture of uh, what the trends are like here in South Africa in particular, and the work that's being done by the JSC, both as the regulator and the JSC is also a company in itself. So Ngu, in terms of the work and the incentives that can be introduced to encourage companies that are listed to uh, be a little bit more deliberate about appointing women at the highest echelons of happening. Thanks, uh, Lerato, and, uh, and good afternoon, everyone who's joined the summit. Uh, wonderful to be here. So uh, let me just start by taking a step back and just say for the JSC, this has been a journey that has been ongoing for quite a number of years. We introduced governance requirements as part of our listing requirements actually as one of the very first exchanges in the world to do so for various reasons that are perhaps not important uh, to go into right now. So our market participants um, became accustomed to not only reporting to stakeholders on financial metrics, but on what has become now ESG. Although I have to say in those days, G was the big issue because clearly as an exchange, transparency, integrity, all of those things, investor protection is what you're trying to go for. So it's been an evolution. And so the second point I would make is that one of the reasons I think this whole diversity uh, transformation is so difficult is because culture is a whole society change. It cannot be undertaken at a level of a company, a level of a sector, or indeed even uh, you know, so private sector versus public sector, as you said at, you, at, at the start. It needs to be a whole society endeavor, and therefore it takes time. So in South Africa, given the post-apartheid landscape and government's own efforts to implement a transformation through BEE, through employment equity, JSC could actually tap into some of that to move the part of the ecosystem that we could influence in, in that direction. So having had companies report on these metrics to the Employment Equity um, Commission, we could simply then insist that if a company wishes to be listed on our market, A, they had to adopt a board policy on diversity, and in particular, be clear about the targets for race and for gender that they commit to, to their own board. We are not prescriptive about the, the targets that they must meet. We just want them to publish them. And from that moment on, on an ongoing basis, to report back to their shareholders and the wider stakeholder base how they are performing against those metrics. Ultimately, this is a push and I mean, Maya said something really critically important from our perspective. This is a push towards parity. While I personally support quotas, I have seen them work. European exchanges are simply the most representative from a gender perspective since quotas were introduced there. The danger with a quota is that very quickly it becomes a maximum. So people have ticked, I've got my 30%, I'm done. That is not, that's just a start. Where we want to be getting to is parity. So in my mind, how you choose or the instruments you choose to get there are perhaps not as important as being just dogged, deliberate, and persevering about how you move the entire ecosystem towards that ultimate goal. So in our minds, where we are today uh, in this very, very recent Sustainable Stock Exchanges benchmark report, JSC was placed in the top half of you know, performance above median globally with 28.5% of all board seats on the exchange occupied by women. 
but certainly first in Africa, as Mayowa's uh, numbers also showed that we simply are uh, at, 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 uh, at the top in Africa. But I have to stress that it has taken time for us to get here. And in my experience, and you can see the hair that there has to be quite a bit of experience, change is not linear, right? It happens slowly, slowly. And then one day you blink and everything has changed. So question actually that would be really good to hear from the researchers amongst us like Mayowa is do they think we are close to the tipping point because I don't think we're just going to see incrementally every year until we get to 50 I think we will tip over and start to see far more rapid change and it feels to me that we may not be too far from that so net net um, because we as a company have a woman chairman, we have a woman CEO, we have a woman CFO, we have a woman who runs our post-trade services, and we have very recently appointed a woman as our COO. It then starts to crowd in female talent, female skills, people have psychological safety to do what they need to do, and to lead in a way that resonates with their deepest beliefs and they don't have to present in any kind of masculine fashion in order to be taken seriously. And that is just, I suppose, our own bubble within uh, the exchange. But I do have to say my successor next year is a man, so it doesn't always go one way. So diversity goes both ways, right? So, um, so I think it's been, uh, for me, quite a joy to see how we have made strides, at least within JSC Limited, in the time that I've been chairman uh, in this journey. And I know it can be done. It just means somebody out there must care enough, must sponsor, must ask, must probe, must push. Okay, and I, have, um, I haven't finished with you yet. I just want Mayowa to answer your question. Are we near the tipping point? I, when you look at, I was actually surprised when I looked at the research in 2019, because I actually thought that you know, given all the narrative and all the conversations that had been have, happening around uh, sort of parity, that the outcomes would be um, better than than what I saw. Um, I think at an aggregate level, um, you know, perhaps not. But there's some what I didn't say, and I think what I we don't do enough. Well, I'm a consultant, so I always look at what's wrong. But what I didn't do enough of is celebrating what, what I term as bright stars of the continent, right? So there are some countries where actually over the last couple of years, we've seen some significant movement, um, you know, in terms of uh, gender participation, both in the workplace, but also in society. And I love what Uncle said about it's a societal, it's, it's like a, it's a systemic change. It's not just the private sector, it's not just, you know, the, the public sector, it's everywhere that has to, to happen. So I think in certain respects, we are seeing some of that. Um, but I think that, you know, from a continent-wide perspective, um, given, you know, the varied outcomes across the countries, it's, we're not quite there yet. Okay, thank you for that. Nko, I want to come back to you, Nkulu Lego Nyembezi, and you used the term it's about being dogged in implementing the change. Now, South Africa has a particular context. We don't have to go into it, but um, because of democracy and what it meant, there needed to be affirmative action targets, there needed to be gender targets, there needed to be black ownership targets. And with that, we've seen quite dynamic shareholder activism, certainly on issues around race in uh, business transformation. What can stakeholders do within their individual companies, just drawing on that kind of history to say, in as much as we were dogged about changing the complexion of leadership in corporates, we now need to change and introduce diversity, both in a gendered way and also in the diversity that we've spoken about earlier on. Well, it always actually starts with a few leaders and and what they do. I mean, I also serve on the board of Sunnah Bank. So um, the speaker that came just before um, talking about what Sunnah Bank is doing in the gender area is just one example of the kind of, uh, of thing you're talking about. And very recently, we said, well, we're 25% now, women on the board, is it time to push? So there is certainly no shortage of the lead companies starting to pick up gender in a more serious way. Um, and I have to say they're not enough, but even with race, 
when we started, it was the standard banks of the world, the GSEs of the world that were leading the charge there. Um, I do think that in South Africa, though, to be fair to corporates here, um, there has been a lot more drawing in of women in just the recent past than uh, we've seen for, for a long, long time. Uh, what tends to stand in the way is you get a woman getting an executive role, let's say a CEO, um, and when she leaves, there's just no bench strength to replace that person as, as they leave. So I think even without necessarily going for the top, top roles where corporates should be measured is anytime there is a position that is being that's you know being interviewed for is there a woman candidate and if we could just push just on that because that's almost the first step to always going to present this woman candidate typically when you give women that chance they'll do the rest you know so nobody's asking to be molly coddled they're just asking to be given an opportunity to be heard to be considered uh, and so i think if you take the lens down a level and say, is that starting to happen in middle management and perhaps in senior management in organizations, you might not be as pessimistic about the future as we are when we look at the CEO, particularly of the publicly listed company CEOs. So, so I think the, the whole point is all of us, wherever we go, if we just insist, okay, you've got a short list, who's your woman candidate, that can start to create the momentum that you're, you're talking about. I'd like to introduce you now to Temi Popola, who is the chief executive of the Nigerian Stock Exchange. Temi, I'm going to say you're the carnation amongst the roses, and thank you so much for being here. Now, Nigeria is a fascinating country, so dynamic, so diverse. It's also Africa's leading economy. I know that the NSC has been undergoing a huge transformation over the last 10 years with the demutualization. Now that you're walking into a new era, what are some of the things and the work and the incentives and the rules that can be introduced to really um, raise the mantle when it comes to women's issues and women's leadership uh, in Nigeria and in the Nigerian economy. All right, great. Uh, thank you very much for the question. It is a pleasure to be here surrounded by women. Uh, that's not a loss to me. Uh, but yes, indeed, we have just gone through this corporate restructuring. Uh, at the exchange. Uh, and one of the things that it does for us is what I call flexibility, really across uh, the enterprise uh, to really address issues like this. If you look across our institution, uh, for example, we have a company, a regulation business uh, that directly supports the exchange that's run by women, uh, has very strong board representation, for example, about 65% women. Uh, I say that really because for us, we like to start first from ourselves uh, and really to ask uh, how we look to address this subject. Uh, as an institution, we're engaged in several partnerships. For example, uh, we have a partnership with the IFC, uh, the Nigeria to Equal Program, where we really look to try to address three things. One is how we can drive women participation in the labor force, how uh, we can drive entrepreneurship uh, for women, uh, and then of course around governance uh, with women representation. Uh, uh, when I listened to uh, Maya's presentation earlier on, I do agree. Uh, the data that we have also uh, from some of this work that we do uh, does suggest in line with global sort of benchmarks, this 25, 27% sort of group representation, particularly among the top 30 stocks listed on our exchange. Uh, away from that, of course, uh, as I said, uh, it's not lost on us. Uh, that some of the strongest uh, proponents uh, and voices and perhaps levers uh, that could help drive this are exchanges, similar to uh, the NASDAQ uh, initiative that has been discussed earlier. Uh, so directly addressing your question, what are we doing? What do we think exchanges can do? Uh, it's interesting to note that quite a few exchanges actually already uh, do quite a bit of work and quite a few institutions also uh, using exchanges or using the markets uh, addressing this. Uh, you might know, for example, of the FTSE 
Women on Boards Leadership Index series. Uh, there's a Bloomberg Gender Equality Index, for example. Uh, there's an IDB Invest Gender Focused Social Bond um, as well. Uh, what do we think exchanges can be doing globally? Uh, we think that, for example, in line with all these initiatives by NASDAQ, uh, there could be more engagement of regulators to encourage listed companies to report on diversity metrics. Uh, of course, it's important for me to say that in markets such like ours, where listings are few and far between, just cyclically where we are, I think it's understandable how we can go to what I'll call the extremes on this subject. But there could be baby steps like this, getting our corporates to uh, report on the diversity metrics. Uh, there could also be requirements from applicants actually to disclose you know, material convictions or judgments against them that violate you know, gender and social related issues. Uh, or perhaps, indeed, one of the things that we are thinking about is offering uh, a separate listing segment that screens for gender metrics uh, as the world increasingly looks to explore this point. I think finally what I would say is that for us, uh, yes, indeed, there's a lot of rhetoric around this subject, uh, but it certainly is more than rhetoric for us. It's something we take very seriously. Uh, all the way from our hiring policies to governance and to some of the social efforts that we support. Thank you. Uh, Timmy, we're going to stay with you, and I'm really glad you mentioned that there's the possibility of creating a smaller um, exchange where, where, where gender-focused initiatives can be looked at. So my question to you is, you know, um, from the work that you've done, has it been found that gender-focused funds, bonds, that, that sort of thing, those instruments, that they do have a material impact? And just by way of answering also, just be aware that uh, Nongulu Lagos got something she'd like to add. So why don't I let her go first, if that's fine? <laughs> I'm quite relaxed about that. Thank you so much, Temi. Um, just on the point that you, you made, um, in South Africa very recently, actually as recently as August, um, one of the PASIC passive um, um, investment companies launched an ETF and they have introduced to that ETF a diversity score. So they have you know, four things that they look at and based on that, they will give you a diversity score. So for example, we are now thinking of going to them and saying, can you also add just the gender one and if a company scores well on that, they get even a higher diversity score so that investors out there, retail or institutional, that want that kind of exposure know that this is an ETF to support. And we've seen this with the climate um, focused and sustainability focused funds that have come to the market. They've had a huge amount of support from, from the public. So your point about exchanges can work with ecosystem within which they, uh, they operate to start to create products for this kind of investment, I think would be a really huge support to women asset managers, entrepreneurs, um, uh, um, women who are looking for capital of, 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 that, of that nature. Actually, a lot of the research does support this. Uh, there's a very popular piece of work done by McKinsey, actually. Uh, it shows that you know, boards that have higher women representation, for example, have a 30% uh, higher chances of uh, you know, just performing better. Uh, it speaks to, you know, companies run by women. Uh, they tend to be run better. Uh, and I think also if we just look in our, call it maybe perhaps anecdotal lives as evidence, uh, there are certain strengths and skills, uh, frankly speaking, that, you know, women bring to the table. Uh, so I think that the argument certainly has gone past whether this is the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do. Um, uh, and frankly speaking, again, if I look at our country, Nigeria, it's something the government even takes very seriously. We have a central bank of Nigeria, for example, uh, sort of mandates to financial institutions for at least 40% female representation on their boards. It's quite a strong statement of policy to have. Um, and this is the way, frankly, that we view it. Thank you. And Mayo, I have a question for you, and it's a little bit of a curveball, so just bear with me. But it was just prompted by um, the introduction that Anne Alica made earlier on. So a lot of the conversation we're having here is obviously looking at um, capital markets and companies listed 
publicly? What are the trends um, in private companies? What are the trends when we're looking at startups and the work that's being done by venture capital um, and other kinds of investments? Because just last year, I'm looking at a report from uh, Brighter Bridge and First Check. The largest proportion of money coming into startups came to Africa last year, $3 billion. But you know, only $21 million went into women-owned businesses. So there's somewhat of a disconnect. And I'd just like to know softer targets that can be introduced in this area of business. That's harder to monitor. But uh, what would your recommendations be? No, I'm actually not surprised at all. So we did something similar. We looked at Nigeria. We looked at, um, in my, I, I call this my, my nighttime job. In my, in my daytime job uh, with financial services, I looked at... Um, in 2019, 2020, a uh, list of 200 of the top fintechs in Nigeria, and looked at the funding. And if I ask you to guess how many of um, how many top fintechs have either a female co-founder or were funded, you'd, you'd be surprised at the number. I think at the beginning of 2020, I think the number was three out of 200. So it is absolutely dire when you look at the, the situation in other in, in some of these industries. Look, my, the way I think about it is you don't get what you don't measure for. So similar to what Nkou said about quotas and targets, where you saw targets and quotas being put in, you saw a sort of remarkable, remarkable, remarkable change. So in uh, Timmy, Timmy, Timmy talks about the CBN in Nigeria. I can give other examples. Um, in South Africa, for example, what, what happens in politics when you, need to, when you have 50% representation of your ministers, that's because someone has said it has to happen. You have the same in Rwanda, you have the same in some countries such as Senegal. So unless, unless someone says this is what needs to be done, we actually don't see the, the needle moving significantly. I think there's a balance that needs to be made between sort of quotas and people filling in just because they want to meet the quota versus putting the right candidates there. In. But even then, and I know this might not be the popular thing to say, this is my own personal opinion, right? Does it really matter? Right? Does it really matter uh, to, to, to a certain? We need to get a little, we're coming from such a low base, we need to even uh, the, the playing field a little bit. And I think one of the ways to do that is we really ensuring that um, there is right laws, right targets, and so on. But also, the mind, there's a mindset shift, right? There's an absolute mindset shift around uh, sort of gender parity. And it's, again, for me, it's not, I keep saying it's not enough to talk about it, it's not enough to have conversations amongst women. Um, I think someone said a little bit earlier that the, 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 the greatest, the predominance of, of decision makers are, are men. So we need to have more men in the conversation. Um, and we just really need to begin to make, you know, to, to convert conversation to, to action. And that's part of one of the reasons I do the research I do. I think we need enough facts to have sort of fact-based advocacy around these issues. Thank you so much for your contributions and for answering my questions. I know that there may be one or two questions that are coming through from the uh, delegates to the seminar. So what I'd like to do now is defer to Teresa Clark, who has been moderating some of those questions, and she can raise them on our behalf. Thank you, Lerato. Um, one of the questions that has come from Pam Reeve is, what are the networking search firm or board-ready boot camps or other supporting activities to bring more women into boards in Africa? Anyone want to address that one? I know that there's quite a few, um, I'm going to have to say micro-level um, initiatives around, and I'm not going to even say South Africa because I don't know anything outside of Joburg happening, but I have personally, for example, addressed um, such small gatherings, invite 12 people, 20 people, put them through their paces over a number of days, invite uh, seasoned board members to come and address them about how do they approach their first time out on a board. But we don't have the same kind of formal structure, I think, that Susan uh, represents in the U.S. here um, at all that I know about. And I have to say it was essentially to try and bring in the youth factor onto our boards because our boards simply put the average age is 60 um, and meantime South Africa's average societal age is under 25. Therein lies the mismatch in trying to make decisions um, that are fit for purpose for that society. But I, I don't believe that in our market there is a systematic way of doing this piece of work. And perhaps this is an entrepreneurial um, 
uh, opportunity for someone who loves this kind of work. Yaku, I wanted to mention, we do have a number of chapters in Africa of women serving on boards, uh, and we can get you some more information on that. We have two major chapters in New York and LA called Board Next, which is board preparation. And as a part of our longer term strategy, we are looking to take that to scale globally. So I just wanted to, Teresa, do a little shout out on some of the work that you and our New York chapter members do. Another question that has come up is, so at the end of the day, this is a question for the two heads of the stock exchanges, the chair of Johannesburg Stock Exchange and the chief executive of the Nigerian, soft targets or listing requirements, which one does it take? I think in my remarks, um, I did mention that we have essentially um, opted for an outcomes-based approach. Um, and so this is, we're driving towards an outcome of parity. Um, we know there's going to be steps along that way, and we want people to be quite transparent as they gradually move. So we have essentially gone the soft targets route. Um, and the reason for that is quite simply that, and Tammy actually spoke about this, this is why I wanted him to say something about it. Um, it is the fact that an exchange is also a company that needs to look after its own financial sustainability and your financial sustainability greatly depends on having a strong market participation so that people don't feel overburdened with rules. So to the extent that you can achieve the outcomes you are seeking through a softer target, it would be hard for us to square up why we would go with a hard-coded um, quota. I think if we were still struggling to even bridge, I don't know, some unreasonable number like 20, 20, 5% after this time, it would have to be time to start thinking of stronger actions such as a target. But we feel we are making progress on the softer targets. And it, in my mind, what I've learned from ESG and particularly the climate element of it is if you can incentivize the investor base that uh, essentially are the ones that buy and trade stocks to start getting excited about a thing. It's amazing what you can achieve. Who could have thought that we'd be sitting here today and without us actually mandating TCFD, TCFD is effectively becoming a standard today and exchanges are kind of coming from behind to catch up. So, so I think rather than um, hard-coded quotas, in our case, particularly in South Africa, because we haven't had opposition to this, we just have had slow progress. Um, it's how we can get investors to see the gender lens in a similar way or in as serious a fashion as they have reacted to climate. And you could argue, even with climate, it took them a long, long time. But the biggest difference between that particular topic and the gender one is that in the climate case, it's been couched as a risk, which of course it is. It says, as you invest in this company that uh, mines coal, do you know the risk that you're taking on board from a climate perspective? And that essentially ultimately caught the imagination attention of people. How we sell the gender side is, Tammy just said it, you will gain because a diverse board will have better outcomes financially. Well, what we now know about behavioral uh, economics is that human beings have far more sensitivity to the pain of loss rather than to the pleasure of gain. So how can we turn the narrative to investors so that they start to push issuers on this case and therefore you then have this pincer movement where the exchange does some and the investor base does some. And so just finally, you have to actually be uh, right for the environment in which you are. Uh, let me add to that very quickly. Uh, there was this California law, uh, it's quite popular at the time in 2018, uh, mandating, I guess, that uh, there should be at least one female board member um, in any company that's uh, based in California. Uh, this law was praised at the time because just on the face of it, it's you know in line with what is the right thing to do. Uh, but then a year later, PwC ran a survey 
Uh, and what they found, 83% of directors uh, and over 50% of the female owners ultimately thought that was not a very good idea uh, for some obvious reasons, like, I mean, what if there's a shortage of good female directors in California? Uh, that ultimately has a knock-on effect, perhaps, around broader governance issues on these companies. Uh, but also some of the points that I think Nico just made uh, around really uh, behavioral science uh, and how best to get things like this done. So certainly uh, I think the softer approach is what works. Uh, people would always, I think, bow to superior arguments. And indeed, as we said earlier, as more and more data shows that this is the right thing to do, uh, we've seen this around everything SDG today. Uh, if you look across the investment community, uh, a lot of the top now is on sustainability, uh, not because there's some hard rules around it, but just because it's the right thing to do. But I think it has higher chances of ultimately sticking. Well, I think we are just slightly over time. We're not going to run on Africa time too much today, so we're going we're going to cut this short. I want to thank you for what I think was just an amazing conversation to be able to have in one place the head of the Nigerian Stock Exchange, the chair of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, the partner from McKinsey who's done work on these women, the U.S. perspective from women corporate directors, all moderated by a BBC journalist. I mean, I just think that this topic has been addressed especially well. We'd like to think, thank um, all of the panelists and moderator and especially our um, thought leadership standard bank who helped put this together didn't just write a check but they invited several of you to be a part of this and we thank you for that and now it's time for me to just make the closing comment which is in particular um we've celebrated the women who've gotten there today that's what this has been about we've talked about getting more there through stock exchanges and we have been challenged, even though we're just a media company, as we went about this work, people have said, okay, so what? You celebrate those 50 women, what are you doing? So the first thing that we are doing to bring more into the pipeline is one week from today, we are hosting our first training session targeted at women across Africa who've been in the corporate sector for less than five years. The title of it is Unspoken Rules for Women Who Are Climbing the African Corporate Ladder. We ask all of you to share this information widely to women who work in corporates for less than five years to join us. It's free. We have another fabulous set of speakers. We have another woman from our list of CEOs, Ida Diaria, who is the head of Visa, in Africa, her title is Senior Vice President and Head of Sub-Saharan Africa for Visa. She will tell her inspiring story. And then we will have Gorak Ng, who has written a fantastic book on the unspoken rules, secrets to starting your career off right. He's a researcher at Harvard Business School. Um, I know that he is a, a Ma Asian American man that we want to talk to black women in Africa, but trust me on this, I've heard him speak. And his mother, he was raised by a single mom um, who was a housekeeper and a maid and he helped his mom do her cleaning as he was growing up and then had an opportunity to move to the private sector he went to harvard himself and when he moved into the private sector he realized that there were a lot of rules that he didn't know about when you move into corporate sector and he will be sharing a lot of those insights with us so i invite you to please we will send everything to all the all of you who are here today panelists registrants, please share this information widely because we want to do our part in helping to prepare that pipeline. And that's the first step that we are taking. As I've said earlier, this is a movement. It is not a one-off. Um, we expect to see all of you again um, on this platform and on other platforms that will all uh, work towards our ultimate goal of seeing more women in the C-suite across corporate Africa. So with a hearty thank you to everyone involved today it's a wrap, and we look forward to continuing the journey. Thank you.